All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is January 16th, 2024, although this probably won't get posted till the 17th, but we'll see how that goes. With that, today we are going to spend some time in in different areas, different sections, but you'll you'll always see as it always happens in all of these teachings, they'll always connect and they'll always be the portions that relate. And you know, understanding that that we are a ministry where, where revelation is being revealed, where the mysteries are being revealed, we know that we are a group being prepared. There are mysteries that have never, ever been revealed in history that have been happening for almost six and a half years. And so we are preparing, we are watching, we are praying, we are diligent. You know, somebody was asking me the other day, what is it that that makes somebody ready and watching, that, that makes somebody uh, um, ready for the pre-trip. Well, let me go to three key verses that reveal the understanding. Okay, there are things that we all know. You know, love one another, right? Love the Lord and love yourselves, love your neighbors, right? But what else do we know? We know in Luke 21, 36, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So what are, you, what are you supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be watching and praying, okay? So to keep awake, be watching. Now, what a lot of people think that means is that as long as they're watching videos, right? If they're watching videos on when the, the pre-trib's gonna happen, that's good for them. And, you know, I, I don't let it affect me as much as I used to, even though it still bothers me, especially in our ministry. It, it bothers me a bit because I think, I've always believed that the majority, the vast majority in the ministry are are watching, right? That that they're watching and diligently seeking and and going to the word themselves and, and studying out these videos. Otherwise, why would you keep coming back to watch the first 20 minutes of a video and then just keep turning it off? It makes no sense to me, yet that's what the average is. So, you know, this is like this right here. I knew this was going to catch a lot of people's attention. The Revelation 12 sign countdown revealed. It was a great video. It gets a ton of views because it was a topic everybody was on. And then I do the last video, ties that bind Jew and Gentile. And guess what? It's got 1,700 views. So it's going back on course on par with the time frames to reach what the other ones have been normally reaching. Yet this one was, was awesome. This was a video that that really shows you that the revelation we've been given here, the spirit-led revelation of the word of Jesus Christ, his word being revealed to us is to bind the Jew and the Gentiles. It's, it's the revelation, it's the understanding that we have that, that brings together the prophecies of the Jews and what the Jews are looking for compared to the prophecies of the church and what they think they're looking for. The Jews and their prophecies aren't confused. It's the Christians and their prophecies that are all confused and twisted about. But we saw in the video from that, that rabbi that what they lay out is absolutely what, lay, what we lay out, but they don't understand the events and the things within it and, and the overall time frame. But they've got the overall picture. But to Christians, there is no way they, they could see it outside of those here. Because we know what's going to happen again. We know a Messiah ben Joseph is coming at the end of six years of seals. We know that events of seals take place first for the church, for the world, the house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in. This was a powerful video to help us realize, to help everyone realize we have the revelation that ties the Jews and the Gentile together in prophecy revealed. Awesome, awesome stuff. So. So this is one place, 2136. So what does watching mean? Well, it doesn't just mean watching videos for when the Lord's coming. It's diligently seeking his word as well. Well, how about that? Doesn't that take us to another place? If we go to Hebrews chapter 11, we come to Enoch. So to, to be accounted as Enoch was, there were two people that were raptured, Enoch, who vanished, and we have um, 
uh, 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 um, Elijah who went up in a whirlwind. One is the pre-trib picture. One is a mid-trib picture. Enoch is that pre-trib picture. And what does it say about Enoch? That he didn't see death for he had this testimony that he pleased God. Verse 6 of Hebrews 11, but without faith. So, of course, there's another one. You need faith. You need to be watching. You need to be praying. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of them that, what? Occasionally look him up on Sunday. Occasionally spend time with them at uh, Easter and, and Christmas. Or those who diligently seek him. He's going to reward those who investigate, who crave him, who search him out, seek after him. They're inquiring diligently. This is, this is part of the pre-trip. Does that mean somebody has to only be a part of this ministry or, or the watchman community? No. There are people seeking the Lord out in his word diligently every day, drawing closer, seeking his word, just understanding it and overall understandings and pieces that they go to on a daily basis, spending time with them. With us, it's just more specific in prophecy. But it's not only prophecy because the prophecies have revealed everything that bring us back to creation. So there's another one, faith and diligently seeking. Well, what else do we have? Let's go to our third famous one, which is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. I knew a man in Christ. So those that go above in the right before the 50 days begin and then the 14 years start, what is it? Those who are in Christ. There you go. In Christ. Who's this group that are in Christ? For that, we go to Romans 8. And what does Romans 8 tell us about those in Christ? Those who are in Christ, spirit-filled. They're not walking after the flesh. They're walking after the spirit. They just so happen to be in flesh bodies that we can't wait to get out of. Does it mean we never sin? Does it mean there's no oh, there's no place? We, we can never sin? No. As long as you are in flesh, you're still susceptible to sin. Which is why we repent daily, like Paul. I he 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 what uh, uh, he died daily. We have to repent. We have to ask for forgiveness of those things. We have to ask for the strength to keep from them. So what do you see? In Christ, spirit filled. Uh, in faith, watching and praying, diligently seeking, and loving one another. Sounds pretty fair, doesn't it? He gave us His Word so we can get to know Him better. The only way to really draw closer outside of prayer is seeking his word. Prayer will get you far, uh, so far in certain things. But I mean, to get to know him, he left us his word. He left us letters. So that's what we got to do, right? We're going to keep diligently seeking. We're going to keep lifting each other up, strengthening each other. You know, that's why we have this forum as well. For those that don't know. You can go to ministryrevealed.com right here. Here's the website right here. That's the home page. And you can go to right here to the forum. And when you go to the forum, take you a few seconds to sign up. And this is it right here. There's a bunch of posts. We have uh, just the general area. We have prayer requests. And this is our brother and uh, some of his team in Uganda. So, you know, they're bringing food to help the poor. They buy Bibles. Uh, they're buying Ministry Revealed books. So here's a whole slew of people with our Ministry Revealed book. And, it, and it's this ministry here. It, it is all the people that are a part of Ministry Revealed from around the world that provide all of this. Our brother Steve in Uganda right here with his son and his daughter. He's got a new little girl too, a new little baby girl. This ministry is the one that does all the providing for them. So we got a great deal on the Ministry Revealed books there to be printed for like $4 US each. I can't even get them that, for that here. And that's because uh, one of his brothers, uh, 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 Victor, I think this is Victor. I'm not, I, I might be wrong. Um, but Victor has the printer. And so he gives us the best deal possible so that what they're doing is they're bringing salvation as they go on tours all throughout Uganda and surrounding areas, bringing people into faith, into salvation, into repentance, giving out Bibles, 
And then once they have an understanding in their salvation, they begin to share with them the revelations to prepare a people because the season is at hand, right? And then there's all sorts of things, studies, videos from others uh, sharing and, and making points of it, uh, um, words that are shared, right? We see here with Matthew, you know, making points, all sorts of things. So that's a place that you can come join us as well. And, um, you know, it's it's a community of people where we're lifting each other up, we're strengthening each other, we're, we're loving on each other, we're, we're helping how we can. We're doing Bible studies. Different people are starting Bible studies in different parts of the world together and within their churches on these prophecies. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to do our best to to provide. But January always makes it very tough. So we haven't been able to supply support for the Ministry Revealed books and some of their needs for travel over there in Uganda, as well as here in the ministry. So, you know, if anybody can. Uh, and you want it to support, you can go to ministryrevealed.com. You'll see links throughout ministryrevealed.com right here. Go fund me or PayPal, or even just by clicking on this link right here. When you do that, you just scroll down and you see the places right there. It's, you know, we're coming into a time of the end, guys. And uh, we're just, we're, all we're trying to do is reach as many people as we can. That's it. That's our goal, to help our brother in Uganda spread the gospel and reach as many people for salvation as possible and on our end to help prepare and ready a group for the lord when he comes and i believe that that group is a worker group and so today as we get going into this we're going to cover something that we've shared you know in a few videos lately and i've talked about how every single time that i have seen a video like this over the years there's been a big change in the person's life um, when they were translated or taken to heaven and had an experience. There's been a massive translation in their life, a, a, a transition in their life to the Lord. And they all explain seeing the father in a certain way and fully seeing the son in another way. Well, when you see this one, it's awesome. So we're going to cover a few minutes into it uh, in two parts because it's, it's awesome. What he talks about and what he shares, what he sees when he's there is fantastic. And then what he says in the second part we're going to share is what he sees in another area, but this was in a, in, a, in a vision. So the first one is about a translation that he experienced. The other one is dreams. One, one, is, one was a dream and the other one was a vision. And you'll see what, we talk, what I'm talking about when we get there. You'll see this one. This is uh, from our sister Petra in South Africa. This is the... the the uh, her YouTube channel, I kept trying to remember his fair maidens, and I keep forgetting it because she used to have a different channel name, and so I I kept forgetting it. So we're gonna share a few minutes on this as well because I thought it was awesome that that Mike in uh, at interrupts one six five had recently we did a live show maybe two or three videos back of Mike's, and he went into an area about uh, Ananias and his wife, and. Then Petra had sent me a message before my last video, before this last video, about talking about me giving a, a long rope. And she didn't know I was in the middle of setting up this picture for the thumbnail with a rope. And so these types of things happen between Petra and myself like crazy. It happened so often we stopped tra keeping track. You know, the first five, six times, it was like, oh, my goodness. I do a video and she was already in the midst of preparing one and getting one going. And the many of the topics within it were touched on in the same points. And so this has happened so often. Now it's been so much. I can't even count how many times we've done this. And she incorporates within her teaching. So where, where ministry revealed prepares a people in, in a, a preparation for the understanding of these things that are going to take place in the end and is readying them with these revelations, with these mysteries being revealed, to study them out and to diligently seek the Lord in them, she incorporates that, but she does it in a way of preparing now, in a way of, of being ready so that when these things that we teach on do come to pass and a remnant worker bride is chosen, which we believe is, is a strong portion from among a large number from among these groups, our two groups, are going to be ready to receive the Lord and ready, clean, prepared, 
for the Lord when he says that they're going to serve him. And so this is a lot of what she does as well. And this video was just her latest one posted earlier today. It was fantastic. It was a terrific, terrific video. And wouldn't you know it? She talks about the scriptures with Ananias and his wife. But she comes at it from a different perspective than what Mike did and what Mike was talking about in his video. Well, lo and behold, in what I was tying into my video, I was already preparing before she posted this earlier today. The video I had been preparing ties in. So there's three different parts or, you know, it'll all tie together. But there's essentially three different parts to tonight's video. And it's all off the, this first one, then hers, and then a third one. And she ends up talking about it, like I said, not realizing that I was also going to be incorporating the story of Ananias and his wife as well. Funny how that works, right? It's fantastic to see how the Lord works it. So if you want to grow and, and draw closer and, and understand these things in preparation, come and visit uh, her channel here called His Fair Maidens. This was a terrific, terrific teaching. And then we're going to go into this one. And this one's called The Donkey Speaks. <laughs> I thought that's pretty funny. This is actually a fellow Canadian. Uh, I believe I've tried reaching out to him. Um, I know others have in the ministry as well. But like anything else, you know, I have never heard back from anybody. Nobody outside of them wanting me to just go give a talk, right? Like um, Deep Believer about a year or so ago, two years ago. And um, I did a blog uh, talk on one. But outside of that, those that have channels and ministries, I never hear back from any of them. But it doesn't mean we don't watch some of their stuff. It doesn't mean that that we point out some of the things that they have within their teachings and then take it deeper. And that's what we're going to do a little bit with their their alignment in the wilderness, as well as what is understood about the four Gospels and their representation it, it these things are to show more evidence to to show the support of the revelation that we've been showing this is why it's so fantastic within the forum that we can take some here and some there and people from all over the world within the ministry as they hear these things as they go and then search them out in these revelations they're coming across other things that they're finding and then they're sharing them and there's another guy when this when this guy does live shows with another one he does live shows with a guy from the UK and we've shared some of his teachings recently. So again, <laughs> they don't want to share us, but we're more than happy to share them and to grow on these things that, they, that they're glimpsing, but they're, they're in other directions. Not that they're wrong in their directions, but we're showing it more prophetically and in the deeper sound of it prophetically. So we're going to spend uh, two little parts here in one minute uh, of this video. We're going to show two sections and uh, we're going to talk on that as well. So sip of coffee, turn my heat down a little bit. You know why I can turn my heat down? Because it's not minus 33, it's minus 13 today. So thank you, Lord, for a breather. It'll get cold again the next couple days, but compared to what it was, it's practically spring. <laughs> as crazy as that might sound, it's practically spring. So for anybody that's newer to the ministry, I know there's always newer people. And there's been a little bump lately. So anybody that's new to the ministry, come start at this playlist right here. On YouTube, the playlist is called the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. Start with the first four videos. Because a lot of what you're going to hear is really going to kind of, it, it's going to be over your head. Because you're going to realize that the Gospels are speaking to different groups of people. And that was the beginning of the revelation here in this ministry back in 2017 in September. It started with this revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to that then revealed that the end of days was a period called 14 years, which is seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets, which revealed that it was Mark's discourse and Matthew's discourse. Mark's is the seven years of seals. Matthew's is the seven years of trumpets. And that left, as we saw in 2 Corinthians 12, the portion called above. That portion called above in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 above 14 years ago the above is 50 days and that's why we know that the bride of christ the luke the pre-trib 
like Jesus in Luke's gospel, going to the cross was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful. In Mark, it's purple. In Matthew, it's scarlet. There's, perp there's reason behind this, right? A white, radiant, gorgeous robe is a bride. Purple and scarlet are colors of tribulation that the woman on, on, on the beast rides, right? She's arrayed in purple and scarlet. Mark and Matthew are both left behind during seals. Mark is the, is the world, is the house of Israel, the Gentiles that are grafted in, which is the church. That's the church. That's the world. That's, that's the world of, of church that's not ready. They're not diligently seeking the Lord. They'll claim Christ, but they're, eh, you know, don't really spend too much time, you know, go to church maybe a couple times a year. Or even if they go to church on Sundays, it's like wealth and this and all that stuff instead of digging and spending time in his word. Not all of them, but I would say 90% globally. And we know that because 10% of the church goes first and the 90% will remain. Those are the children of the light. The ones who go first are the children of the spirit. You see, and what do we know? Above 14 years ago, the above is Luke's group. And so you'll realize within this, Here's another place you can go. So you can either go to the playlist. Since you're on YouTube, you can always go to the playlist. But if you come to the website, go to the intro page. And the first four videos are here as well. And this first video is a 22-minute intro of the next three. This is the one I was telling you where the differences are in the Gospels. You'll realize that the prophetic differences within the Gospels or you'll realize that the differences within the Gospels are not contradictions, but they are absolutely proven out prophecy. We've shown that here in this 30-minute intro Bible study. We'll show you exactly that. These videos, you can do one-click download. Our brother Jimmy, who takes care of our website, set it up so that anybody on your phone, on your tablet, on your computers, one-click download if you wanted to save it and share it with others. Study notes, one-click download. The link to page to where it is or you can just watch it right here on the website as well once you realize those differences in the gospels you'll realize the above in 14 years at the end of days it's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets you'll see this in this 30 minute intro as well and then it gets to the big one how was all this missed well it's because the entire world for centuries has been taught from the gospel of matthew as its foundation and Mark and Luke in the Synoptic Gospels were simply looked at as pieces to fill in the blanks. Well, turns out there's way more to it than that. And their, perfect, their purpose goes way beyond all the way into prophecy. And you'll see Mark is to the pre-trib bride of Christ. Luke, uh, um, sorry, Luke is to the pre-trib bride of Christ. Mark is to the mid-trib great multitude rapture in Revelation 7. And Matthew is to the return of the Lord feet down. A taking, a taking, and a return. Just like we read here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The first group goes to the third heaven. In the third heaven, where are they going? They're going to the throne room. They're going to the inner court, right? To, to, to the inside, into the temple. Paradise is the outer court. And then what do you have? The third time he says, I'm coming to you. You see, Paul here is a prophetic picture of, of the end of days in the picture of pre, mid, and post, a taking, a taking, and a return. And it all happens in 50 days and 14 years. So as we get into this, you're gonna see why this is so important and why I always tell everybody to watch these intro videos first. After you watch those intro videos, then you can keep scrolling down and go much deeper in. This is a three hour study on the, the, the video of the differences in the gospels. You'll see the discourse is revealed as you have never, ever understood them before. But to understand it, you must know that Matthew, Mark, Luke in the end is Luke, Mark, Matthew. The last will be first and the first will be last. It will blow your mind. And all sorts of things, pre, mid, post, they're all true. So everybody that, that disputes everybody and goes back and forth, we prove from Scripture, all of it is from Scripture, proving to you that pre, mid, and post are all true, and it's revealed in the Synoptic Gospels of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. So with that, let's get started here into this first one.
So this is just really exciting. There's there's some there's some great stuff, and then there's a little bit more frightening stuff. But we can show it all with scripture. We we've, we've shown these things with scripture. That's why I think in the last several months, well, no, in the last couple of three years, maybe. I've shown three or four, maybe five, but I think three or four videos similar to this of people that have had experiences, and it's all the same. And, and what I mean by the same is the father is seen in one way, and you cannot see his face, and the son, you see fully. You see his face. They know what he looks like, the whole nine yards. But then it gets even better. So let's have a listen to this. At least diffusing the light a little bit. And the light was just coming. And so to get started, he's um, he he was already translated. He's talking about this experience in heaven, being a younger guy. You know, he knows he can't see the face of God, but he's trying with all his might to see the face of God. And this is what he's telling you during his translation experience that he had. Through it, it just hit my face and I would just be blinded. So I, I had to just look at where I was going through the cracks in my fingers. And when I got to the front, I was pushed down, punched over just like this in the weight of his glory. And. I'm being crushed into the floor, like like a tidal wave, that that kind of feeling where the weight is all around you. And uh, at that moment, I was determined to see his face. So I'm pushed down like this, and then I start looking up as slowly as I could because I'm being just shaking, I'm trembling, I'm holding my hand up. I see his throne come up into view as I'm looking up. I see his feet, and his feet are huge. He, he's big, you know, at least the way he showed himself to me, he was much larger than anything or anyone I saw there, his feet were as big as a house. You know, he was probably what we would call two to 300 feet tall or something like that, you know, a couple hundred feet tall compared to me. So his feet, as I'm looking up, I'm seeing his feet like up here and I keep looking up and I'm being pushed by the weight of his glory. And as I'm looking up more, I see his legs. I see, I see the throne and I see him sparkling like a diamond in the sunlight. It's the only way I've ever been able to describe it. You know, when you hold a diamond up, all the millions of colors that come at you, it was just like that. And he's shown I knew he was in the shape of a man, as Ezekiel saw. I saw the shape of a man on this throne, made of complete white, utter white light, sparkling the colors of the rainbow. And I get up to here, um, to his, I was able to look up to here whenever I was trying to look up. And I saw his arms on his throne, and I was still trying to see his face, you know, but I'm being completely, utterly crushed at that point. And so at that moment, his arm kind of came and covered his face, and he reached down and touched me. And then he blew me, which blew me away. And like dust, uh, that's the best way I can say it. It was like I was just nothing before him. And he demonstrated how how uh, all-powerful he is and how little I am compared to him, which is a great thing whenever you want to submit to him. Um, and it was fascinating. I, I, I'm glad he did that because I'll always know how, uh, so to say, large and in charge he is. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, I like that. That's that's part of the awe that's uh, oftentimes referenced, but uh, too little practice. I think we've lost some of that, haven't we? I mean, but but you're there in this gargantuan father figure again I'm, I'm like empathizing with much of what you said and some others that i've interviewed but that that what, what was your sense then dalton obviously awe but what was your sense at that point when he's breathing you know, like the like the, the ashes in, in the wind with such power and might what was your sense of what he was doing to you it was so, when he breathed upon me it was so fast that there was no chance to to even discern it um and he blew me somewhere i'll, I'll get there but before that in that moment that you're referencing while i'm up there close to him the sense I felt then, I even feel now, it is of complete, utter love and power. And I, I felt I felt unworthy, but I also felt so encouraged at the same time. And I felt like nothing mattered but him. Mm. I still feel that way. And and he he thinks we matter that much too. But it was that feeling of holy are you and great are you. And there is none other but you. There has been none other. There will never be another. You are God. And you deserve everything I have to give. You know, I goosebumps and electricity while I'm saying that. Mm. I, I bless his holy name. Powerful just to... Uh... Just, just to hear it and picture it in your mind's eye, right? Just that light and that glory and trying to look through and just, oof. In the name of Jesus. And and uh, it was it was amazing. And whenever I, I speak to him even now, um, he hides himself from me sometimes and makes me seek him. So it's not like I can just wisp in there anytime. He is, he, is, he, is a, he is the God of immense and vast mystery. And we should always understand that he has much more for us to discover and much more for us to see in him. Even if we go to the throne ourselves, he has a forever with us that he has planned. And so there's no end to our marvel that we can experience in him. Uh, I think the Holy Spirit wanted me to say that. Uh -huh. I love that. Yes. <laughs> Resonates <laughs> in my soul. Yes, sir. Um, and next up, I, I get to see paradise and, and Jesus. Um, Here we go. Now listen to this part. And so this is where he blew me. He, he just 
blew me away and I whisked away like like a leaf in the wind kind of, you know, I, I would just blew away. And now and he's in paradise. I appeared uh, above a, uh, a realm. Uh, I try to use words that scripture uses. Uh, I, I appeared above an earth, a realm, a piece of land. And I looked down and I saw springs of water everywhere. And I, uh, I determined, actually, before I even saw the springs of water, I felt the temperature. And the temperature was was tropical. Like it was, it felt great. But like, I've never been to Hawaii, but I've been to the Caribbean before. Felt more like that. It just was so nice. Probably 80 degrees, 78, something like that. And there was light everywhere. And it was a, it was like a, a morning. And looking back, it's almost like those old hymns, the eternal morning. It was like that, a morning forever. It, like the morning was never going to go away. Mm. And there was mist everywhere. And I'm in the air above, above this, this land. And I was able to look down. And just like I said before, the eternal realm, when it's expedient for you to know something, you can know many things. So I was able to perceive a lot about this place really fast just by looking. I was scanning the ground. I could see there was no thorns and no thistles, no, uh, no, no abrasive animals. No, I, I don't believe mosquitoes are there. And if they are, they can't bite you. You know, they're probably eating fruit or something, but <laughs> I don't like mosquitoes. <laughs> but uh, there, there's nothing abrasive there. And I was looking at the ground and there was moss where you could just walk barefoot. And there was springs of water every, you know, 20, 30, 100 feet. Uh, and they just billowed up from the ground and calmly just trickled everywhere. And the trees and the plants, I didn't recognize a lot of them, but they were they were beautiful. I just can't. Some of them look like palm trees, but I can't really. I, that's all I know is they look kind of like palm trees. But I, I think everything there is probably an upgraded version of what we have here, uh, for sure. Um, I didn't perceive all the details of those things. I just saw how much vegetation was there, and it was a lot. And and the springs of water. This water, when you heard it trickling, it's like you wanted to drink it. It was it was such a strong desire to drink of this water. Let me pause it there for a second. <clears throat> okay, here we are. He was in the throne room a little bit earlier, which we didn't play. He talked about them praising. So when the father spoke, they all, all of them that were in the throne room were praising and worshiping his name for, for the words and everything that he was speaking. Okay, that's those in the throne room. That's the, that's the pre-trib group. That's, wh that's where the pre-trib group is going. They're going to the third heaven. We know where the mid-trib great multitude rapture group is going, and they're going to paradise. That was one of the purposes to lead you into this. We know. That the first group goes to the third heaven. That's the Luke group. This is this is why when people say, oh, what are you talking about? This is Paul talking about, you know, the time when he was there. Yes, you need your prophetic eyes to understand. How was Paul in Christ in the above 14 years ago, like a hapazzo, like a rapture to the third heaven? And then the next time he was kind of like, he was kind of like in Christ, not really like the first one. So Paul was in Christ, and then he wasn't really fully committed in Christ, and then he went to paradise? You see, there's prophetic revelation in these differences within the wording. And so we know this about the first group, going to the third heaven. That's where they're going. So where's the second group going? Not really like the first ones in Christ, but kind of, sort of. And where do they go? They're the was caught up that go to paradise. This is the Revelation 12.5 piece, was caught up. As you know, this is the group that goes at the mid-trib great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. Well, what do we know about this seventh year of seals? What if we go to Revelation chapter 7? What happens at the great multitude rapture in Revelation chapter 7? Let's go to the last few verses. We go to verse 15, 16, and 17. Therefore, are they before the throne of God and serve him daily in the temple. Okay, there's the first group there. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them, and they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall there be sun on them, uh, nor any heat. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. Where is he going to lead them to? Where is he going to lead that group to? He's leading them to paradise. Where's paradise? The place with water that you just, you just desire to drink it up. And where did he see it? Paradise. Well, listen to what happens next. And I was just in awe again, as I was before with the Father. And I looked to my side, and I saw Jesus, our great Lord Yeshua in the air. And he was just wearing a, a, a robe and a, and a purple sash. And he had messy hair. You know, kind of like the depiction that the, the kid drew from South America from heaven is for real. That that. So here's that depiction. So this is this is the one that most people will agree with when they see Jesus. This is what they say, you know, kind of messy, blown hair, shoulder length, more green than anything else in the color of eyes. 
is the most like who I saw, you know, and obviously uh, I don't believe that we have to uh, have graven images to seek God uh, of any sort of kind. Uh, a picture is great, but nothing can do the real thing justice. But I will say out of any picture, uh, that's the most like to Jesus I saw, you know, just deep green, brown, so many colors in his eyes. But I remember green specifically uh, being prevalent and um, Hebrew face, all of skin, you know, uh, and, he, and he had a good stature. He was he's not he's not a weakling. He, he's definitely a man. Uh, and uh, he looked at me. And I started crying and I'm just, my eyes are wide. I'm looking at him and I'm Listen like, to what he said. Jesus, I, I felt the love immediately. I felt, mm -hmm. I felt his embrace. I knew he loved me. And I looked up at him completely speechless and he looked down at me and he laughed. Nice, deep voice, you know, he said, ha, and I've made these for mine to enjoy forever. And even you, my son. And even you, my son, I've made these. Let's, let's have a listen to that again. Hebrew face, all the skin, you know, uh, and he, and he had a good stature. He was, he's not, he's not a weakling. He, he's definitely a man. Uh, and uh, he looked at me and I started crying and I'm just, my eyes are wide. I'm looking at him and I'm like, it's Jesus. I, I felt the love immediately. I felt, mm -hmm. I felt his embrace. I knew he loved me. And I looked up at him completely speechless and he looked down at me and he laughed with a nice deep voice. You know, he said, ha, and I've made these for mine to enjoy forever. And even you, my son. And I've made these for mine to enjoy forever. Guys, you understand? What, what did you hear what he said even before that? When he turned and he saw Jesus? What, what do we take out of this? He saw the father, but couldn't see his face. And it was shining in the power and awe that was in the throne room. See, he was translated into the throne room. Then he gets blown by the father like a leaf. And he's now in paradise. And he, he's in paradise and he sees these waters that are just so desirable to drink. They're so perfect. You just urge to drink them. Just like what will happen with the great multitude. Then he realized when he's in paradise, which we know is for the great multitude rapture. And who do we know the great multitude rapture is for, brothers and sisters? We know that Jesus himself said he came but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the Gentiles are grafted in to the house of Israel. This is the great multitude rapture. He came. He didn't come for those that were already in faith and salvation and so forth. That's not who he's coming for first. Now, are they being taken out? Are they his? Yes. But remember, just like the typology of Leah, he didn't come. Uh, uh, Jacob didn't want Leah. He was expecting Rachel. We know this story plays out all throughout Scripture. But Leah, of course, was the much more loyal one, right, than Rachel. And then what do we see? What, what's another great story in um, Judges? Chapter 15, what happened with Samson? Ah, listen to what it says. We haven't talked about this one in a bit. And this is ch 21 chapters. They're in order, but they go in reverse for the end of days. It's an end of days pictures going in reverse. And in chapter 15, we see, but it came to pass within a while after the time in the wheat harvest that Samson visited his wife with a kid. And he said, I will go into my wife into the chamber but her father would not suffer him to go in. And after, uh, and her father said, I verily thought that thou had utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. So who was his first bride? The older. How many times have we seen this, right? It's the older before the younger. It's the winter wheat before the spring wheat and one of our sisters in the forum shared this today as well this is a great video for anybody who's newer that wants to understand what's taking place in these things watch this right here it's only about an hour and a half it's the harvest of the earth reveal the prophetic timings it's going to blow your mind you will understand that winter wheat goes before spring wheat the older before the younger the old wheat before the new wheat, the winter wheat before the spring wheat. And so we're seeing this, this picture of it in relation to uh, uh, Leah going first. But in what he's talking about here now, what was I going to? We're seeing the waters. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Let me go back to the video. We saw that the, the father's group is that first group. The second group, which we know is Jesus's group. So he really didn't come for the spirit group. That spirit group is 
quote unquote being what? Given to his companion. You see, if we go to Revelation 22, we see this, right? What does it say? Um, verse 17. Yeah, verse 17. Revelation 22, verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. You see, those who are the bride are the ones who are in Christ, spirit filled. We've talked about this many times. It's that it's that first group in the in the first creation of spirit of Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2, what people have called the gap theory. We've talked all about it. When Jesus in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 1 was made light, you see, and God said, let there be light. This was Jesus. In this point here, Jesus was made light. That's exactly what we read in John chapter 1. He was the word and the beginning was the word and the word was made light. The word was made light. That's Jesus at the creation of days now about to start. Jesus is first made light. Well, it had to be Jesus. You don't hear too many people talk about it. But if it wasn't Jesus, then why down here on the what? On the fourth day, on the fourth day, he made the sun and the moon. So that couldn't have been the light of the sun. It was the light of the S-O-N, the sun, right? God the sun. He was made light. And so when Jesus comes and he comes to say, I am, I am come to, to uh, shed light in the darkness. He's talking about this group, as we all know, these, this group of light beings that were created during the days of creation. That is the Mark group. That is the church that's left behind, that, that wasn't ready, that wasn't prepared. That's the group. That's the, the creation group, the creation creatures that were made. Let's go down here. Let's see where it is. You see, in this created portion, these creatures that were created, this is the male and the female that were created in light. Right, Because if they were in the Lord's image and he was light, they were created in his image, which was light. And then, of course, we know they were deceived and, and things happened and so forth. And in the, in the prophetic is to come, the first group is the spirit group, those that, are with the, that have the spirit of God. The second group are the ones who are of the light. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't have the light of the Lord and that you're spirit filled. You see, because we're also what? Well, we're living in the portion of Judah because Judah's is the portion of flesh. So everything is for the Jew because we're living in their portion of time as we've shared in many videos. If you're new, this is going way over your head. I understand that. But for those that have been around. So we've understood this and we understand why in John chapter eight, for example, Jesus shows up. And, of course, he tells them in verse 12, uh, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And when Jesus comes as the Son of Man for 40 days in the above, in the 50 portion, before the 14 years begin, he's coming to shed his light in the, on the darkness and to give this light unto the remnant disciple workers, which we call the remnant bride. It's all about light. This portion that's Jesus is all this group that is going to paradise. The, the great multitude rapture group is going to paradise. So he sees Jesus. He gives the same description like everybody else. He sees the water of paradise. He, we know that they go to paradise. We know that they are Mark's group. And you say, well, if you're newer, you're going to say, well, wait a second. What do you mean we know it's Mark's group? Well, let me show you something. That's why if you're new, going to the intro to understand those differences in the Gospels will be extremely powerful. You see, in Luke's Gospel, as I had mentioned, Jesus was arrayed in a gorgeous robe. And you know what? This is something I've, we haven't 
actually share it. I mention it often, but I don't share it. Look at what Jesus was arrayed in in Luke, in a gorgeous robe, which means bright, clear, gorgeous, radiant, okay, like the gent like a bride. You go to Mark, and Mark, Jesus was arrayed in purple, and the purple here is 4209. When you go to Matthew, you see that Jesus was arrayed in, where is it? There we go, in scarlet. So you have gorgeous white, you have purple, and you have scarlet. Well, how about that? Purple. So the one for Mark is purple. And we know that the prophetic picture of the crucifixion to the resurrection in Mark is a prophetic picture of the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. What happens in the seventh year? Well, he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion because at the end of the sixth year of seals, where everybody sees him coming and everybody's freaking out, they're seeing whatever it is coming down and the world's in a panic and they're hiding in the caves and in the holes and everything else. They're seeing him coming on heavenly Mount Zion. And so what is he arrayed in? Well, he'll be wearing white with what? Purple. Purple is the great multitude rapture group to paradise. And he sees Jesus in paradise with a purple uh, um, sash on. You see how awesome that is? It's so perfectly, perfectly fitting. It, it's precisely the things that we've been revealing in Scripture. Right there. One little clip. And Jesus says, I have prepared this for mine. You notice he, he didn't say for those that were in the throne room, right? For those that are my fathers over there. No, he prepared this for his. It's where the great multitude rapture group is going. The lost sheep that he's coming to save. It's awesome. I love it. Let me show you another one. So the synoptic gospels are the groups of the pre, mid, and post Luke, Mark, Matthew. John's gospel is a gospel that stands on its own. And it's pretty fascinating. You know, I didn't invent the synoptic gospels and then say Jan, uh, John stood on his own. It was already understood by, I don't know, hundreds of years. Well, the revelation of the end of days is exactly that. The synoptic gospels, Luke, Mark, Matthew, and John represents the entire period of time over the seven easy years that are coming to an end. And then from chapter 8 to 21 is a prophetic picture within it of the end of days. Well, we know that at the end of Mark, at the end of Mark's time, before the great multitude rapture comes in, which is all of that group of purple. So Jesus is coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the mountain carved without hand at the end of seals, at the end of the sixth year of seals. And at the beginning of that seventh year, what does he do? Well, he's there. He's arrayed in purple. He seals 144,000, and they help bring in with the other workers, remnant workers from seals, they help bring in the great multitude rapture before they go work trumpets. So we know from Scripture that the group that is going to be sealed, the 144,000, at the beginning of the seventh year of, of seals, the 144,000 are also connected to purple. But it's not exactly the same purple but they are of the same purple because this is the purple of those who go to paradise. And then there's the purple that they are from, which is the purple of the workers that will be there during trumpets. Want me to prove it to you? When we go to John, John chapter 19, we see that Jesus was arrayed in purple again. But this purple isn't the 4209 purple. It's the 4210 purple. It comes from, look at this. It comes from the 4209 purple. And you think, well, what does that matter? Well, I just explained it to you. They come from the great multitude rapture group. Remember what it said in Revelation chapter 14? Watch this. In Revelation chapter 14, when you have the 144,000, Standing that are that have the father's name written in their foreheads, they sang a new song. 
Uh, da, 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 da. Verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Um, they, uh, da, 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 da. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes, which these were redeemed from among men, being first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. You see, they were taken from among them and helped bring in the great multitude rapture. And then now they're going to go work during trumpets as the grape portion, the first fruits from the grapes. And this is the type of thing that you end up seeing in John. John stands on his own because what you come to find out, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in a bit, is that John is talking to the workers. He's, he's a prophetic picture within it to the different worker groups along the way. And the easiest one to see is the group from Trumpets, who are the 144,000. You'll see this, for example, in, um, let's see. You see this with the 144,000. I think we'll, we'll get to it in a bit. But here's an example. In John chapter 15, you know, actually in John chapter 14, John chapter 14 is a prophetic picture. See, seven easy years. Once those seven easy years are done, the 14 years begin. Seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. And so this would be chapter 14, the seventh year of seals. Okay, which means he's coming with the place prepared for them. He's coming to receive them unto himself that where he is, there they may be also. And it's a place prepared. Okay, not just furnished, but furnished and prepared. He has prepared this place for them. And that's what he was saying here. He's saying, I, I did this for mine. So what's in paradise? The mansions. The place that he has been preparing for them, he is now coming and he's going to receive them unto himself. And then when you go to chapter 15, it's the first year of trumpets. And then you see the story. He is the true vine. Now we're going into the time of grapes. The harvest of the wheat and those things are done. And now we're going into the time of the grapes. And now it's Matthew's portion. They've been removed from the land the first seven years of seals. The land has had its time to rest. Now they're back into the land. The rebuilding is going to start. And here is the high priest, Jesus Christ, the, the Messiah, Ben Joseph, through Ephraim. And these guys are now to produce fruit. And it's the easiest thing to follow and to track along in John chapter 15, 16, 17, 18. You can really see the clear picture. In fact, when we go a little bit further, you'll see a little bit more of what I mean in this. That Luke is one group, Mark is another, Matthew is another portion, and then John standing on his own in, in a conversation to the workers. And you'll see what I mean by this, by the, the different portions of the way they were set up in the wilderness. It's quite fascinating. And you'll see in the portion that relates to a time during seals, you'll see what happens. And that, that representation is right there in the midst of seals. And it just so happens that John talks about it. it. It's awesome. It's really wild to be able to see these things, to track them, to follow them, and to put them together. So now let's keep going. Let's go to this next piece, starting at 51 and change. Let's have a listen to this. Um, but we're limited, and he's not. So that's just maybe some conjecture philosophy about it all that I've come to. I agree with it. You know, you're, you're when I originally had heard uh, your account, uh, I mentioned to you that it bore witness to me. Um, I guess I've <laughs> maybe developed a, uh, some discernment having interviewed many people and having gone through an experience myself. Uh, and, and yours really excited my spirit. And I prayed, I said, Lord, please, uh, when we reach out to Dalton, let him say yes, because um, I'm that excited for what you've done in his life. These need to be treated as a sacred event. And, and I hope those who hear this and, and uh, see this uh, receive it that way. But there's a place also more recently that the Lord had taken you, Dalton, um, and this was, for, for whatever reason, I'll let you tell us, uh, the Lord and told you why, that you had experienced, um, I think it was, you said, a vision of hell, not the tran a translation that you experienced out of body yeah. in heaven, but this was different. It was multiple experiences in one week, and it, and it was two in one week. And before that, I had another vision that was a warning to me. And I am going to... 
the spirit of conviction and repentance and, and true holiness, you know, be honored in what I'm saying. Uh, and I'm not condemning myself in saying this, but I'm saying this out of the fear of the Lord. So the past decade, after I had my heavenly experience. Hi, I'm renovation expert Scott McGilvery, and I know the bad stuff that can happen with the bathroom model. Not with I went and I chased my own dreams. I went through a horrible time in my life about that time. Relationally, I made some horrible relationship mistakes, and it tore me up, and I ran from everything. I moved to Tennessee. I chased my own dreams. The Lord warned me. I, I could hear him. I've always been able to hear him, but I just I was being a rebel, and I'm being honest. And I went and chased my own dreams. I did country music. I played in all the bars. I did festivals. I've traveled, played thousands of shows. I've produced music. He blessed me in that, and he told me he would. But he also told me back in the day, he said, you have an expiration date on this. You are called to be mine, and I will call you to myself, and I will give you some years with this, and I will bless you in this, but you will come to me when I ask you to. He told me that before. <laughs> how many people have had that experience, right? Now, I don't know how many of you have been blessed to have the Lord have actually told you that. That would have been pretty awesome, right? But you guys know my story. It's, you know, it, it's not how it worked because the Lord, I, I've been chosen not to have these visions and dreams and not to be spoken to in audibles, but to receive revelation through the leading of the Holy Ghost to understand prophecy that has never been understood before. But I could see in exactly the type of thing that he's saying that that the Lord allowed me to go about and do the things that I want to go do things my way. And when the time was come, he said, no more. Time to take you out of this. Now you're mine. I've had that exact same type in a different way, but I've had that same type of, of experience within my life. I know Petra's life is like that, who we're going to show in a little bit as well. And I know it's happened to many, many others. And, you know, our brother Steve in Uganda, another great example. You just, the Lord has a purpose and a plan for all of us. And some of us, it just, it, it's more, it becomes more obvious. But for others, it just might be with their family. It might be with their circle of influence. But that is your purpose. Although here... <laughs> I believe you're being prepared for even more. And I think most of us get that. We don't know for sure yet though, right? I believe I know for sure for myself now, but everybody as a whole, I don't know that it's everybody as a whole, but I believe a large segment of the ministry of those within it, not just watching for the escape date, but those who are diligently seeking the revelations, those who are understanding it and tracking it and, and praying over it and seeking him diligently within it. That's the group. But the rest I believe we're also preparing so that when that time comes, they will be ready to meet the Lord and to be a part of that group, uh, never having tasted of death in the third heaven. You see, but there's so many experiences like this, and the and in everybody's life, it changes. Your your life completely changes. I <laughs> I I feel like I'm kind of the same person, but I know I'm absolutely not the same person that I was. You know, he, he even talks about, oh, I would talk to people about the Lord sometimes, and I was a believer, but I was going off the rails hard. You know, so hard that he talks to another part here that we're going to get to, that is this portion just above hell, this group ready to go to hell. And I believe that's what, uh, not that I was seeing that in, in my events that you know of when I needed the blood transfusion, when I, when I was hallucinating for like a day and a half before going to the hospital, that... I was seeing people in my house, under the blankets, under the table. I was seeing them in the backyard. I mean, it got bananas. It was so crazy. And I believe if I had died in that moment, if I had never gotten to the hospital and I ended up dying, I would have been with this group that he's going to talk about in a little bit, that when hell then opened, this group was taken. And that scares the crap out of me. Every time I ponder it, you know, it's interesting because I was just having a, a talk about that, <laughs> excuse me, with one of our brothers uh, on Sunday. And uh, that was just part of some of the topic and, and what led into some of these other things here tonight as well. And, um, you know, he sees what happened with that and that scared him, you know, so it, it very similar, but but realized or come to us in different ways. And I know it's the same thing with many. The Lord has pulled you out of something and drawn you to him. Don't let the enemy pull you back. Don't let time pull you back. You see, don't let the missing of a date here or that there or this there. We have to be strong and stand stronger than ever before. We must remember, we must understand 
we are coming in. We are in the tail end of this Laodicean age before the seven churches start over again. It is only going to get more difficult. So we must stand strong. We're here to encourage each other, to strengthen each other, you know, to talk with each other, to meet when we can, if, if we're close to each other. We have to remember these things. Because you see, he was just talking about the glory. And then he was talking about being with Jesus in paradise. And now he's going to talk about stuff that's not quite pleasant that he saw. And it's a great reminder. Because as, you, as you've pictured these other two parts in your mind's eye and, and the beauty and the awe and the being in the presence of the Father and then being in the presence of the Son and just like, oh, man. Well, now he ends with the less pleasant part. And I want you to listen carefully. Before I ever left. But I spent all those years pursuing my dreams, my passions, my ambitions. There's a lot of words in scripture about that. And I ignored them. And I didn't live right. And uh, I, I, I reaped the, the, the horrible, bitter waters of that. In, in what I was doing. And uh, although at the same time, I could be in a bar after a show and I would be ministering to people because the Holy Spirit never quit using my gifts. Uh, and uh, I've been able to touch and minister to a lot of people in some dark places along the way. I never lost my acknowledgement or love of God. I just, uh, the Lord says, if you love me, you got to follow me. And I wasn't living right. And so the past few years, he's called me to himself. Uh, I was leading worship uh, at, uh, at a very popular place here in town, Nashville, or Mount Juliet, Tennessee. Uh, had some great experiences. I've been growing in the body. Um, and, uh, and, and I was also running sound too. I was really just anything they asked me to do, play guitar, sing, run sound. Um, and uh, so he's been calling me unto himself and I've been answering in the steps that he's asked me. Um, but about six months ago, I had a vision and an angel came to me and he was a big angel. This was, I think this was an archangel because it was, this angel had some authority that I sensed that was just very high up. He took me into this room and he showed me these records on stone. It was like books, but it was just, it was almost like engraved in the books. He showed me these records and, and he brought me to, to my name in these records. And he scratched it out and he said, if you continue in your own way, your name and your deeds will not be recorded here. Now, did you hear that? The angel was going to show him that he was scratching out his name if he kept doing what he was doing. Did you catch it? There's more I'm going to show you. But did you catch what he said? If he keeps living the way he was living. But he was still witnessing. He would still tell people about the Lord. He would still share testimony, but he wasn't doing what the Lord was calling him to do. So if he didn't stop what he was doing and now come and follow the Lord as he was chosen to do, you see, not everybody gets it so clearly given like that, right? But there are moments in our lives when things happen, and we can recognize when the Lord is calling us for something. And when you respond and you follow it and you dig into it, you see, imagine that. It kind of sounds like he was still Christian-y. He was still doing his thing. Yet his name was about to be scratched out if he kept doing that. That's scary. Well, listen to what he has to say next. And it was terrifying whenever I had that. And a few months later, I'm starting to give up more. You know, I'm, I'm listening to God. He has moved so strong. And, and I knew even after that warning that it wasn't a condemnation. It was the Lord telling me by the, by the, by the authority of whatever overseer that angel is of those books that I had to obey if I wanted to be recorded in that hall of fame or whatever that was. And I didn't know how I was going to do that. A few months passed by and about one month ago, I had a dream. The first dream I had, I was led down this pit by these beings and they took me down into this pit and they showed me my old self. And these beings were not good. I was just, it's like I was went down there. I'm in this fiery landscape and I see the old me and I see, and, and Satan's there with me, the old me. And I'm, I, I felt like I wasn't the old me, but it was, it was the me that I used to picture myself as it, the, you know, uh, slick and, and, you know, the, the, the fame, the fame, the fortune, the shine, that, that sort of, that sort of me that I was tempted with. And, and, and that me was in hell. And you guys have another program that you guys do. Oh yeah. That, oh, that program started on, with uh, COVID because when it, all the whole world. And the devil was there and the devil was trying to be charming speaking to me who was, who was there. And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to join in this. And then that was the end of that dream. Uh, so I, I refused what the devil had been speaking to me there. And then the next a few nights later, I had another experience. So this person was a dream. The second one, it was more like a vision because it was, it was more, you know how the difference between you have a dream and there's symbology, but then a vision, you're like, okay, I was, part of me was present in this and I was, I was shown this. Mm -hmm. This was more like a vision. Um, and there, there was an angel with me in this one. Uh, he was just hovering above me. And I was placed in this horrible, ugly landscape. Ugly. The buildings were, were decrepit. Everything was just decayed. And it was, it was almost like the broken dreams of, of everyone. Just, it was this waste pit. 
Mm-hmm. And I saw that the ground was scorched. Everything was, the ground was completely scorched. There was mountains in the distance. It was like this valley. Uh, and it, everything was scorched. It looked like Mordor almost in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> um, and wow. so I'm there and I'm starting to see people. And when I saw them, I knew their sin, what they did in this life. And these people were completely lost, wondering. I could perceive this was almost like the outer darkness or kind of like the top layer of hell, the entry layer. Where, and it's like the place where people fall into first before they get sifted. And these people were wondering, completely lost. And I was preaching to them. And I was like, Jesus is the way. He is salvation. I was just speaking uh, what the Holy Spirit was, was putting in me when I was down there. And no one could hear me. No one could hear a single word I said. They just saw me and looked at me like I was foreign. And they continued to go about their way. Some of them had, you know, some of them were like really tore up and mangled. And they were, they were not in a good spot. And I, I saw people that did different sins. And the violence of those sins were repeated upon these people in accordance with what they had done in this life. And they, they were hurting each other. They were hurting. They were all hurting within themselves. They were also lost. And then the one I remember specifically, because I was taken through lots of this stuff, uh, is I go to this car and it's just broken down car. And there's a guy in it and he's, he's rotting, you know, from the inside out. And I knew his sin. He had, he was a Christian that had listened to a drug dealer by peer pressure. He wasn't even that old. And he had died in that sin. And I started crying and I looked at him and I said, why have you done this? The Lord loved you. You had a purpose in him. Your, your, your path was already written for you. And he looked up at me and he couldn't repent and he couldn't hear a single bit of good news from me. Not even one bit of good news. He couldn't hear it. It was, it was, it, it's like that drop of water that Jesus said Lazarus was not going to give the rich man. He could not hear one bit of good news. Hmm. And at that point, I knew I was in hell and I looked around and I saw fire coming up from the ground, lava, you know, and I saw these monsters, these tall, they were tall and they had, you know, spiky hands. There's all sorts of different things, but it's almost like it was time for everybody to get swallowed up. The fire came from the ground and it swallowed everyone up that, that was in this holding chamber or whatever it was. Hmm. And I was lifted up out of this fire as it came up. So did you hear that? <clears throat> There's another warning, guys. Did you hear what he said? I knew that this guy was a Christian. And he succumbed to a drug dealer tempting him to, hey, here you go. And he succumbed to it. And in that moment, the drugs ended up killing him. See, he was in his car and he was all decaying and decrepit in his car because he had probably gotten the drugs and he died in his car from that dose. I'm not saying it. He said that he knew that he was a Christian. And because of what he turned to, when he died in that moment, he was in hell. You see, that's why I was saying with myself in in what was happening to me, that I was seeing these, what I, I would assume they were spirits, but I saw young kids, right? They were, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten. I saw teenagers. I saw some older people. I mean, my family, my wife, my kids were younger at the time because this was uh, about, well, over eight years ago now. And, and, you know, I was seeing people under the table, like I said, under blankets, on the couch, in the backyard, in the front yard. I mean, it got ridiculous. But not one of them could speak to me. Not one of them. And when I'd go to try to get close, even though they were spirit and I couldn't, nobody else could see them, you know, I was telling my wife, I mean, this is crazy. And, and I was explaining what was happening, and I just thought, man, the Lord's doing something, because I was Christian. But I knew what I had been doing with alcohol, right, from all the wine I had been drinking. Turns out it's because I was close to dying. And not realizing I was close to dying, I was like, hey, the Lord's doing something here. This is crazy. I can't believe this. Well, they couldn't speak to me. They, couldn't, they wouldn't really come near me either. They'd stare at me. They'd look at me. But they would never say a word and they'd never respond. They were probably waiting for me. I'd have probably been in that top layer. Until the Lord said, "Uh uh-uh. And like him, boom, he was pulled out of it. I was pulled out of it. And when I was pulled out of it, it was now time to do the Lord's will. I didn't quite know it yet. Right? I didn't quite know it for about another year and a half. And then... Everything changed in September of 2017. But it was like I was showing myself worthy to to do something, Appears it appears, throughout that year and a half. Well, remember what he just said. The guy was a Christian. I was was a proclaiming Christian, but I wasn't really living like it because I was doing things in secret. I was doing things I shouldn't have been doing. And they were getting worse. Right? So what do we know about that? How many times have you heard me show, share this with you guys? Colossians chapter 1. 
Listen to what it says. Let's start in verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Hello. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Listen to this. This is key. If you continue. You see, this once saved, always saved garbage that everybody tries to feed you, don't listen to it. That's the enemy working through others to try to say, oh, just go live your life. Those people that tell you, oh, it's faith. It, it, Jesus only in faith is, is works. I mean, uh, uh, works isn't what gets you in heaven. No, it isn't. But it's the reflection of the spirit of God working in you and working through you in your faith in Christ that there is a change in your life. That, that you're, you're, you're happy to, to help the la old lady with her groceries to the car. That you're, that you're happy, to, happy to help out uh, a homeless guy with a meal. That you're, you're, you're happy to speak about the Lord and do these different things. People, there are so many people out there that will tell you that those are works. They don't understand. Works aren't what save you. That's true. But they are the evidence of the Spirit in you. The love of the Spirit of Christ in you. If you continue. He saw a Christian who didn't continue but fell. Didn't have his chance to repent. Didn't have his chance to, to get out of it and say, please forgive me, Lord. I'm so sorry. Just I, I, I fell. I tripped up. He didn't have that time. Look what happened. You have to understand this. I'm not saying this thing. This is another person who's saying it. And we've showed many others who have had these experiences. It's the same type of thing. And listen to what it says. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to Every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which has been hid from the ages, uh, from ages and from generations, and now is made manifest unto his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Who's this? Who's this speaking to? Did you catch it? Which is preached to every creature. Which is preached to every creature. Do you know why there's this if you continue because maybe you get moved away by things of this world? There's a creature group. Do you know why it's connected to the creature? I'm going to show you. But that's because there's a difference. There's a difference between those who are in Christ and those who are the creatures. Listen to what it tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, uh, uh, starting in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, here's the thing. Nobody really knows. You could be in Christ, Spirit-filled, and maybe you walk away. I would say if you're spirit filled, there's probably no chance of you walking away. So this is the thing. When people say, oh, once saved, always saved, they don't understand what they're really saying. There is a portion of people predestined who are in Christ spirit filled that cannot be lost. But here's the thing. Nobody really knows who they are until the time comes. Hello. 
But this is what they get confused. This is what they mix because they don't understand these three different groups. They think everything is one group and then Jew and then Judah. They don't understand the different portions. They don't understand the, the pre and the mid and the post all being true. They don't understand that it's Luke, then Mark, then Matthew, the spirit filled in Christ, then those that are kind of like it in Christ, and then those who are for when the Lord returns for Judah. They don't understand that. So when you read something like this, you think that everybody who declares Christ is saved and it's not by works and it's it's a done deal. All you have to do is confess Jesus Christ. Nope. That was just step one. Step one, depending on where you'd like to go. If, if somebody is believing in Christ and confessed Christ and they died, where do you think they're going to go? Well, do you know that the scripture tells us that? We'll come back here to Romans in a second. But the scripture tells us exactly what happens. Just like the one on the cross. Remember the one on the cross that died on the right hand of Jesus? In Luke 23, starting in verse 41. And we indeed just uh, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. So this is the one criminal speaking to the other. But this man, so the one on his right is saying this, but this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in the third heaven? Nope. Paradise. No option for being spirit-filled here. No option to, to receive the spirit yet. That's like people dying, right? If they, if they truly believed in Christ and confessed the Lord, they were repentant and then died. They'd be in paradise. Those who were diligently seeking, praising the Lord, repentant, diligently seeking him, where do you think they are? They're in the third heaven. You see, that's that group. So there's a difference between being spirit-filled as well. And we understand what that difference is. So let's see what this says. Um, this is really, the first few verses is, is the same. Those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, not living after the flesh. And then we come down here, the very famous spots that we always talk about. We come down here, we find out about them. Uh, verse 14 in Romans chapter 8. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. See, remember that? That's in Genesis 1, verse 2. So you have Jesus, who is the beginning, which we'll talk about again in another point. Jesus is the beginning. God is next. So you have the Son, you have the Father, and in verse 2, you have the Spirit of God. So those who are Spirit-filled, they are what? They're the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. See that? But you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Again, father and son. Otherwise, you'd be a joint heir with God the Father. Ain't going to happen. <laughs> okay, you're a joint heir with Christ. If so be that we suffer with them, that we may be also glorified together. So we've taught, you know, there is an is of this, and there is also a picture of this in the is to come, and that's the remnant workers who will take part in suffering as he did during seals and will be joint heirs resurrected with them, glorified together with them. Now listen to what it says next. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to, com to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Okay? So what's about to happen? So you've, you've got the pre-trib group, right? This, this picture of them being spirit-filled that'll go first. You've got a remnant group that'll work, that'll, that'll be glorified with the Lord. And there's, there's a time of suffering. And listen to what it says next. Verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the, there it is again, of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Waiting for the manifestation. So there's a creature waiting for the manifestation, the lighting of the sons of God. 
who are the sons of God. The pre-trib group, but this is more specifically to the remnant workers who are going to receive the light of the Lord when he comes back as the Son of Man for 40 days. So you've got this expectation that the creature, which is the second creation, the light beings, remember we saw they were the created creatures of male and female. So within them, they're waiting for this manifestation in this prophetic is to come picture. The creature was made subject unto vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him um, who hath made, who hath subjected him, sorry, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. You see, the creatures are going to be saved as well. That's the great multitude rapture group. That's the group that Christ called his. That's the Mark group. That's that's the connection to purple. And what are they called? The creature. Genesis, we saw that that was the creature creation. And what did we see in Colossians chapter 1? We see that this portion being spoken to, if you continue. So why, why did I go into all that to bring you back here? To show you that there was a group, which is a group in Christ, Spirit-filled, and what, what do we know about this group in Scripture? They're predestined, right? So if I had, I could, I was supposed to go back to read the rest of Romans 8, but we end up seeing this in the rest of Romans 8, don't we? We know that there was a group in those who were predestined, Spirit-filled. Was predestination here? Yeah, right here. Let's go to verse uh, Romans 8, 20, starting in 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Okay, there is a group that is predestined. The only thing is, like I said, just like saving people, we don't know who's going to be part. Why does that keep happening? We don't know who's going to be part of the pre and of the mid, right? But we can have an idea based on how somebody is living. You see? So there shouldn't be any concern or worry whether you're going to be part of the pre-trip. But you can't be arrogant assuming that you're going to be part of the pre-trip. You can't be arrogant and be puffed up saying, oh, yeah, I'm definitely part of the pre-trib and, and, you know, be all uh, boastful about it. You might have something happen to you tomorrow and things go off the rails and, and you change your mind. You, you change your ways. But we're watching and praying to be accounted worthy, you see? But what do we know about this if you continue? Or there's, that means there's a group of people which is the church, the sleeping church. Those who fall and come back and, you know, new ones come in and other ones fall. And who are they? They're the creature. What do we know about this creature group? We can prove that this creature group is the one connected to Mark. Watch this. Here's the word for creature, right? Creature, creation. Mark 10, Mark 13, Mark 16. Isn't that fascinating? It's even in Mark 13, which is the portion uh, about those who will be uh, part of the rapture group, right? From the beginning of the creation, which God created. And then you've got them in 16 to preach the gospel to every creature. This is where the 144,000, we get a picture of the 144,000 when they're sealed are going to help bring in the creatures, the, the, the church, the ones who were to receive his light, who were the beings that fell that he came to shed his light on. There's a difference in these groups, but we can't live our lives knowing which group is which group. But there is clearly a group that is part of his predestined, a part of those workers. There is a worker group from the pre. There is a worker group from the mid. And there's a worker group from the post. There are three worker groups. 
And this is what we teach on. This is what we're sharing. We're preparing a group of people with the revelation of the understanding of the end of days so that when it begins and the Lord visits you or whoever's going to visit you, but I believe the Lord and lets you know to be girded and ready when he returns from the wedding, we know the pre-trib is moments away. He's going to inform that worker group and they will be a group of people prepared and readied. That's what we're doing. And we're giving the understanding so that when he comes after the wedding, and then reveals the rest of that understanding at the banquet meal for them, there won't be a surprise. They will already have had a foundation of the revelation. And then the rest he will make known. And this is what we see that um, Petra, our sister from South Africa, is doing in combination with the revelations from Ministry Revealed that she then understands and diligently seeks and then brings it in to, to help prepare people even more directly in their walk now to be ready for when these things happen. Because if somebody thinks their life is tough now, wait until you're a worker during the time of seals. Will we have understanding, knowledge, wisdom, and all? Absolutely. Will there be an abundance of, of anointing and, and ability? Absolutely. But will it be all in the midst of devastation too and things that have never been seen in your lifetime or in any, anybody's lifetime once middish seals come up? Absolutely. But you will be the one to bring them out of it. You will be the one to save them and to bring them into places of refuge. Do you realize that? Do you realize the work that this group of remnant workers has to do? Do you realize that they are a group bringing in dead and alive? So there's going to be several hundred million probably killed, but there will be more alive than killed. That it'll be, I believe, a little over 1.2 billion people. 1.2 billion people in the great multitude rapture. The majority of which will still be alive. That's the portion that we are being prepared to take part in serving the Lord for. You see, right now we're having a tough time reaching people, aren't we? That's because these revelations aren't for everybody. Not everybody is being prepared to be a worker, to be a portion of those workers, even with this revelation. So we can't reach everybody with it. I've accepted that now for a while. As much as I try and as much as we all try, I would love to reach many, many, many more. But we can't make any of them see it. All we can do is plant the seeds. All we can do is share it and get better at understanding it. Get better at diligently seeking it. Get better at, at studying it out to make sure we have a good stronghold in it and maybe start Bible studies locally. And start reaching people that way. We've been talking about that a lot regularly uh, lately. Maybe doing things like that. Where you will also get better. You will improve your understanding. And, and how to speak it. And to bring it about to the understanding of others. That's what Petra is doing too. But she's also doing it in a specific preparation. For those being ready. So watch her channel too. And let's listen to a little bit of this here. So connecting this with the coming tribulation, let's look at the type and shadow of this judgment done through his pillars of faith, whom after the outpouring of the Spirit on those in the upper room, came down from the upper room and started to prophesy and preach the word of God with great authority. Peter, whose name means stone or little rock, had an encounter with Ananias and Sapphira, who lied against the Spirit of God by only giving in part of the money they made off selling their land. Note, Peter's name means stone, and in this scripture, judgment comes from his mouth. This is a type and shadow of the judgment that will be spoken by the unction of the Holy Spirit through those appointed vessels for this very purpose, that those who see the judgment of God will fear God and repent. This judgment to speak is not given to all. Uh, let's read that in Acts 5, and we're going to start from verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thy own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? But thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out 
and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. And then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with There you go. Here she is talking about it in relation to Ananias and these things from Acts 4 into Acts 5. Just as Mike had shared from another perspective in relation to teaching on it. And here's Petra talking about it now as well. And in this, she it, it, it's a fantastic study. You guys need to go watch the whole thing. And subscribe to her channel if you haven't. It's it's worth to it's worth watching. She really, really lays it down. And she does receive words from the Lord. She does receive dreams. She does have visions. I believe she has visions. Correct me if I'm wrong, Petra. <laughs> you can always leave a comment. But uh, she definitely has dreams. And she does hear from the Lord. So she puts out these words. And she lets people understand. And she breaks them down. And, and her life is even an experience in a typology in this preparation. So come and listen to her. It's, it's worth your time. And I'm sharing this uh, especially because, one, I kept forgetting the, to remember her channel name, but two, because the teaching is absolutely fantastic. And it's right in connection. It always is. But this one was just really so fitting that I really wanted to share a part of this because how it's connecting into what we're sharing here as well and and what we're build, building into. So so we saw this preparation taking place. We, we saw where the first group is going. We see where the Lord is with the second group and the place that he's prepared for them. We understand these groups with the robes. We understand that there's a remnant group. We understand that that people can fall into their sins and fall back away from the Lord by going back into their sins. We also know that there is a group predestined, but you can't really know until the time comes at the end of your life or not tasting of death and being taken. Nobody really knows unless, of course, you're diligently seeking. You're praying. You're repentant. You're loving. You see, if you're doing these things, then you can have an understanding in a belief that that you love the Lord and you're ready and you're, you're praying and you're, you're doing these things. That if the Lord came at any time, you would be ready. And this is why we know when we read something like uh, Luke chapter 12 that we've shared on many times, we know this is why this is being shared. In Luke, 20, uh, in Luke 12 verse 35, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, you may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to, uh, to eat and will come forth and serve them. This is that first remnant worker group. When he returns from the seven-day wedding, he'll come on the eighth day. For this group, this remnant worker group, that will be with them for 40 days and then will remain during seals. Why do I bring this up again? Because if this group wasn't being told by the Lord before, right before he takes the pre-trip, could you imagine the panic they would be in? Could you imagine the panic you would be in if you were watching and praying? You love the Lord. You're loving on your brothers and sisters and on others and you're, 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 you're repentant. You're diligently seeking only to find out you were left behind. The pre-trib happened. That would be devastating. But it won't be. Because whoever is meant to serve the Lord, they will know moments before the pre-trib happens. They will know. So you won't be left in shock and awe and crying out and freaking out, saying, Lord, what happened? You see, this is very important. So we see this. So now what's going to happen with this group of people? What, what are some of the things? And this was part of a conversation on Sunday as well. It was a good question. 
what's going to happen with this people? There, there has to be, there's, there's something else that we haven't talked about that I think is something we need to ready ourselves for. And ready ourselves for in, in two ways. You know, if we're holding on so tightly to these things now, and please listen when I say this, I am not saying that you do what I'm about to share with you now. The Lord will let you know. The Lord will make this known to you. Okay? Not me. When the time comes, the Lord will make it known. But I think it's a good idea to be prepared for it now. I think it's a good idea to know that you can do some of these things now and not feel like like you're, you know, like you have to hold on to it all. Because what you're about to find out and you already know is you ain't taking it with you. Not even if you're a worker. So what am I talking about? Well, we know this with the wedding feast. This is the pre-trib group gone to the third heaven to the wedding feast. We know this is the banquet, as we read in Luke chapter 12, when he returns from the wedding, he's going to serve them and have a feast. And it's going to be for those workers who are going to be part of the resurrection of the just. And as we keep going down, we read about this cost of discipleship. So here it is. There's the wedding. There's the meal, which means it has a connection to this period of time that's related to the, the 40 days to that 50-day time frame of this conversation taking place. Because what do we know about the end of days? We're, what's a couple things that we know? We know that... Did I want to show this? Yeah, we can just show this. We know... Oh, no, no. Seven churches. We know that right now, we're in the Laodicean age. At the moment of the pre-trib escape, it returns to Ephesus starting over again. And that's why it's so fantastic. Petra actually talks about this as well. But from a different point, as she's talking about it with Ananias and so forth. So what is the beginning of this point? Well, if it's from the pre-trib escape, then what do we know it is? The beginning of the 50 days. So we have the beginning of the 50 days that begins with the apostles, and it'll be the new apostolic age beginning. In the midst of the chaos from everybody that's vanished and the attack in northern Israel and the shakings and, and the stones thrown, all these things that will happen in that first week, it will also begin the time of the greatest revival in human history. Many will be in chaos. Many will be in panic. Many will be in fear. Many will be crying out, that couldn't have been the rapture. I'm still here. But they weren't diligently seeking. They weren't doing these things that we know the scriptures told us to do. In fact, if you ask them, they probably wouldn't even know of those things. Why wouldn't they know of those things? Because they haven't been spending time in scripture. You can only know it through diligently seeking. Hello. So we know this begins the 50 days. Smyrna is a picture of when the Lord returns after the seven-day wedding. So this is the first seven days. This is when he comes back on the eighth day. But both of these groups, the apostles and the disciple workers, will work all the way through seals. But it represents the beginning, the beginning of the 50 days. Okay? So we know that the apostles are the ones who are after Smyrna. So what we saw in Luke chapter 12, this is the group of disciples being forewarned right before the escape. Then the escape happens. This group knows to wait when he returns from the wedding. And right after the escape, in John chapter 20, in John chapter 20, Jesus says he returns the same day at evening. That's the prophetic picture of the, the, the pre-trib escape with, with the typology of Mary Magdalene. And then she remains as, as the, like that remnant bride, if you will. And then he returns that evening of the same day of the prophetic picture of the escape. He says, don't touch me. I haven't gone. He leaves, and then he comes back at evening. That leaving is a prophetic picture of the pre-trib escape. Then he comes back the same day at evening, and he anoints the, Holy, uh, uh, the apostles by breathing the Holy Ghost on them. So these guys will be there first. And when he returns from the wedding, he meets with these guys who he foretold, and then he has the meal with them. Okay? So we know that there are apostles and that there are disciples. But the apostles... Essentially, 
they they stand on their own in their authority and in their power, okay, by the Lord and with the spirit that they receive. Smyrna will receive the Holy Ghost at the end of the 50 days at true Pentecost. The apostles had already received it directly from the Lord. And this is what's called the first watch. Smyrna is the group from Luke 12, which is the first watch. Okay? There are three watches. You know, remember I did the video there. There's kind of like four watches. And that's because really there's three. There's Smyrna, which, which is the, the disciple workers from Luke. There's the second watch, which is the 144,000, which are from Mark from the end of the sixth year of seals, right? To the start, the beginning of the seventh year of seals. And it's the end of Mark's gospel. And then we have Matthew's group, which is the third watch. And that are those are the, the 12 from the 12 tribes. And those are the ones when the Lord returns feet down, who will go out during the millennial reign to bring people to the teachings of the Lord to gather at the time of tabernacles every year. So they're the three watches. But there really is kind of a first one of the four, which is Ephesus. But they're not called a watch. And I don't know why they're specifically not called a watch, but they are the apostles. Okay? And these two will be working together during seals. So why am I bringing that up? Well, this cost of discipleship, this is talking about this period now of time. Follow what it said. You had the great multitude rapture. Here's the wedding in the pre-trib. Oh, sorry, sorry. You had the pre-trib bride of Christ wedding. There's the wedding. You have a meeting with the Smyrna disciple group. And then we have the cost of discipleship. So we have a picture of the Lord here during the 40 days. And we see that there's a great multitude here. Well, why do we get the word great multitude here? Well, just like we had the creature in the other portion. The creature was waiting for what? The creature is the great multitude. They're the ones of the light creation that are going to paradise. They're the ones that were waiting for what? The manifestation of the sons of God. Hello. You see how the order follows? And so here we have this cost of discipleship. And listen carefully because what we read in this isn't this, you know, it, it says the cost of discipleship, but it's not that remnant group. You see, it's not the group that were his disciples that we talk about in the banquet, the Smyrna group. We, you, you would call ourselves, you would call that remnant worker group disciples, but they're a very specific group of disciples. They really are. And you'll understand this. Uh, a great example, I think, is connected to Polycarp. When we went into the, the teachings of Polycarp, you'll remember that in the, I think it's in the epistle of Polycarp, he spoke about how there was a group uh, that he met with, how they knew the mysteries of these things, and Polycarp and them with them weren't privy to them. I think that's the type of thing that we're seeing. We know that there's a group who's receiving this revelation, who's going to have the completed work of this revelation, like the ones in Luke 24, this group being prepared in them, and then there will also be other disciples that will follow on as well. And I think that's what we're seeing here. And so look at what it says here. Um, in ver Luke 14, 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sister, yea, even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Yikes. Picture this now in the prophetic typology. What, what do we know this is talking about? Well, there's going to be a whole bunch of these people that will have family members left, right? There'll be a whole bunch of people with their brothers, their sisters, their mothers, their fathers. That'll still be there. That, that will come from this great multitude after the pre-trib has happened. There will, be, there will be people. The majority of people won't recognize it, but there will be however many thousands, however tens of thousands. I have no idea how many that will realize that this is the Son of Man. When he comes for his 40 days. So there will be people coming. And then you'll have the disciples who have been given the revelation. Who are also making these things known and going to people. So people will be coming to him. And he's telling them, look. You're going to turn and go back to your mother, to your father. To your children, to your wife. Or are you going to follow me? Let all of that go and follow me if you're for real. 
That'll be tricky, right? Not for those prepared. We're talking about those who were left behind who are now realizing it. Think of those Christians that just weren't ready. They believe the Lord, you know, they, they proclaim the Lord, but they just weren't ready. They weren't ready on purpose because they're his. They're his for the great multitude rapture for paradise that he prepared for them. So it says, you cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and count the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he, listen to this, laid the foundation. See, when's the foundation being laid? During seals. He's telling him, look, I've counted the cost. Are you guys ready to count the cost? I've counted the cost, and I'm ready that after I finish laying the foundation, I'll be ready to build my tower, right? I'll be ready to build my temple. And it says, and not able to finish it. Um, all that behold it begin to mock him, <laughs> saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sits not down first and consults whether he be able to with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth embassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Be willing to forsake everything that you have. Am I saying that's what you have to do now? No. Am I saying this is necessarily connected to this prepared remnant group? No. But what you see is that a group of disciples, a group of people from this, once these events happen, he's going to be letting them know. If you're going to follow me, it's time for you to give up everything. And if you're willing to give it up, you'd better be ready. Make sure you've counted that cost. You see, so we're already seeing this, this having to give everything up to follow him. When it comes to this other group, the, the remnant ones that were already prepared, do I think they'll have to worry about their family? Those who are in their homes? I don't. They won't have to worry because they'll already be taken. What about an unbelieving spouse? Well, you know, that's still up in the air. But if you remember, I remember what Mike told us one time. Uh, he, he reminded me with the scripture that in through marriage, right, the two become what? One flesh. The two become one flesh. So the one justifies the other, as 1 Corinthians 7 says, if the one justifies the other so that they have children that are justified, you see, then that other one must be justified so that the children are justified by the one that believes. So I believe that this group won't have to worry. There won't be any concern for their family, for those that are in their homes. But we see this, again, having to give everything up. Okay? There's one thing. Now watch this. We even see it now in this word right here, only found in Luke. So again, Luke's portion is the pre-trib but it's the pre-trib and also the 50 days. That 50-day that portion is to the worker group and while the Lord is here for 40 days. So he's having these conversations. There's events taking place. He's, he's doing signs and wonders. There's a group of disciples with him. He's opened their understanding. He's taught them. They've understood these things. They're helping them and they're preaching and they're letting them know these things that are happening. <laughs> right? It's time to repent. Come to the Lord. And then some will want to be disciples. Some will say, oh, I want to follow you. Are you well, ready and willing to give everything up? So we see this in Luke. And why are we seeing this in Luke? Because just like Luke's discourse, it represents that above the 14 years still. That's what Luke's discourse is. So let's go to Luke chapter 18 in verse 22. Let's see what it says here. Um, verse 22. Now, when Jesus heard these things, okay, let's start in verse 19. 
And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save that is God. Okay, this is about the rich, the, the rich ruler. And he says, um, thou, knowest the, uh, thou knowest the commandments, do not adultery, do not kill, uh, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, all these have I kept from my youth, uh, um, have I kept from my youth up. Wow, that's a pretty dedicated guy, right? He's been doing these things. And the Lord agrees. And then he says, now, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto them, unto him, yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when he had heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall, shall they that have riches enter in to the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. You see, what, what did this represent in ancient days? It represented a, a camel being able to go in through one of the entrances. And what happens is they would have all of their treasures, right, stacked up on the camel, and they couldn't go through. Everything had to be taken off before they could go through. That's what we're seeing here. This is the conversation taking place in chapter 18. So again, it's it's this typology of, yes, there, there's an application to the now, but there's a greater application also in the is to come. This picture of him being here for 40 days and those wanting to follow him and be a part of the kingdom of God. So even when he's here for 40 days, of course, he's still talking about the kingdom of God. Because the mid-trib great multitude rapture, which is paradise, is part of the kingdom of God. So is the third heaven. Both of those parts of the kingdom of God. So when he's saying how hardly they'll enter in, what's he saying? Sell everything that you have. Are you going to be willing to do that? You see, it's such a struggle, right? It's such a struggle. People can have an abundance. but it can be tricky to depart, just depart with it, some of it, right? And this is an is thing happening right now. But in the is to come, this is like the, the one who wants to be his disciple. Look, I've been doing all these things, Lord. He says, yeah, that's great. Now are you willing to sell everything you have and give it to the poor? Mm. Maybe in seals time, it won't be very diff It won't be as difficult. Maybe a lot of those people will have realized what has happened, right? So again, this isn't a picture so much of distributing to the poor in relation to the remnant workers, but it's a picture here in the is to come of those while the Lord is here for 40 days and is telling them, hey, if you want to follow me, go sell what you have. And it'll be a struggle, right? It'll be a struggle for them even having seen everything that's taken place. Because not everybody will believe it. Not everybody will think it's quite that big of a deal, although it'll freak the world out. The whole world will be caught off guard. They would think all the more reason to keep everything that they have so that they could be prepared. They could be prepared with their gold, with, their, with all of their, their money set aside to, to help them out to survive during the time of seals. They may much, be much more willing to keep that and not go give it away, right? So you see this, this context, this thing that's building in it. And it takes us to, of course, Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5. So we see here, let's start, uh, doo -doo -doo, and then pray to play. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, in verse 32. So in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, it says, and the multitude. So remember, all of this you're going to see is telling us in the prophetic beginning of this time of about the 50-day time. Okay, that 50-day that marker. This selling of things that these guys were willing to do. You're going to see now that we're talking 
about a group of people of the remnant. Of the remnant. So where Mike talked about it in one portion, in, in one direction, Petra spoke about it in another direction. I'm speaking about it in the direction of the disciple remnant workers and what's going to be taking place. That there will be going and selling everything you have. But we can see that when you realize that you're working for the Lord and the Lord says to sell what you have, it won't be an issue. So you would think. You see? Otherwise, why did Ananias do what he did? Listen to what it says. Uh, Acts 4, verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Okay? They were together of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of these things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. They never proclaim now. So think about this. This is why I was saying I believe all of our family members, those in our homes, will be taken. They will go pre-trib. And those that are chosen to remain to work, to, to serve the Lord, they will be left in their home, and they will wait for that wedding, for that knock on the door. And I believe the Lord will translate them to wherever this meal is going to be, where he opens their understanding, and they have this banquet meal. And then who knows where they go from there? But this might lead us to understand that they would be sent back to their own home. So within this above 14 years, it would appear there's going to be a time of selling their goods. You see? It sounds like it won't be a big deal. We'll be in the presence of the Lord. That can't be a big deal. You see, this isn't something we've spoken about before. We're getting a little bit more insight into this. They're going to give all their things. There, there's no issue with these guys. Why was there no issue? Because they were of one heart and of one soul. And it says, and with great power gave the apostles witness of, re of the resurrection of, of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the prices of those things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. Hello. You see, that's why I was leading with, with the apostles. We know that they're there first. These disciples are now bringing these things to the apostles' feet, everything that they've sold. So this, you got to remember, we're now in the prophetic looking into the end of days. So how would this look? You know, when I was talking to our brother, it's like, well, you, you, we're not going to post this stuff if you're Canadian, like on Kijiji. You're not going to put it on Craigslist, you know, for sale by owner. I believe that the Lord will send somebody and probably just buy all of our stuff up. And then the houses, this is now just speculation that then our homes might end up just being left like the way they are. Maybe they'll take some things. Maybe they'll use some things. But it may be, it may be just speculation that our homes to those disciple workers, when they do this, that those places become places of refuge throughout the earth where people will be able to gather in protection. Interesting thought, right? Many people have heard of this, that there are going to be places. There will be places, whether, yes, we know some will be in the wilderness, but there will also be homes where people are preparing and doing things across the earth that the Lord is leading them in the spirit to do. Maybe that's what's happening with some of these homes, if not all of them. So I don't believe there's going to be like this long, drawn-out period of people coming to your house and buying this and buying that. I believe it will happen quickly that people will come and give you the money for it. And then what are we to do? Lay everything down. You may not have much. You may have nothing. You may have very little. But it says that sell everything that you have. And we, whatever that amount is, some will be much more. Some will be much less. Some will own houses and land. Others might have a couple bicycles. You, know? you see what I'm saying? But nothing is held back. And we bring it to the apostles' feet. And distribution 
will be made to every disciple based on their work and where they're going. Pretty wild, right? Now listen to this. And Joseph, let me go see that one. I want to see how you see how you say that name. I butcher names badly all the time. Let me see if I can just get this one right. Ezos. <laughs> Joseph. <laughs> how about that? Joseph, who by the apostles was sur surnamed Barnabas. Oh, there we go. Barnabas. Which being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, so they were all doing it, and laying it at the apostles' feet. Did you notice, did you catch that? Was a Levite. He was of the priestly line. Remember what happens to the apostles, guys. When they're part of the resurrection at the end, because remember, now I'm not talking about those who are coming to the Lord, part of the great revival, and want to come and be a part of them uh, during the 40 days. No, we're now at the portion where we're talking about the disciples who were part of the meal, who were with the Lord, and now are selling everything to go and follow with the Lord. And now at the 50 days, everything's been sold, and they're laying everything at the feet of the apostles. And the apostles are going to distribute to each of the disciples based on their work throughout the earth that the Lord has commissioned. The, the apostles will know these things and will give it accordingly. You see? And what do we see? We see this little hint of, of a priestly line, of a Levite. Like a little clue for us. Because we know that the, dis that the, that the disciple worker group are part of those who will take part in the resurrection, as we saw after the wedding with the banquet. We know they're part of the resurrection of the just, and they're part of that resurrection when the Lord returns feet down that will be resurrected, not having taken the mark or worshiped the beast and all those things, and they will what? Rule and reign with him as priests. So they're one of the three watches who are what? Part of this priestly line of people. That's what's happening. That's what this group is. That's that little that little clue that we get in that. But it doesn't appear everybody's going to be willing to do it, right? So we come to Acts chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, Sa Sa Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter, you see, because they're going to know these things. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? You see, <clears throat> why are you lying to the Holy Ghost? Remember, they, these guys received the Holy Ghost. The, the apostles received the Holy Ghost at the beginning of the 50 days. The disciples are receiving the Holy Ghost at the end of the 50 days. Right at this, so within that period of time is where this selling will take place. And we're having here a prophetic picture of somebody who's like, eh, that's quite a bit of money. Maybe, maybe we'll hold back a little bit, honey. Maybe we'll, we'll hold back just a little bit and just give them this. How many do that now how many do that now and these weren't poor people it was land it was not even everything let's look at this sold a possession they sold a single possession and brought it so it, it can happen to people whether they have a lot or whether they have a little they still think eh, and they're going to hold back that little bit extra that's why the woman with the two mites that's all she had and she got great, uh, um, I was going to say a great review. You know, she was highly spoken of for what she had done because it was everything that she had. This is something I learned many years ago. You know, I'll tell you a brief story with myself that when, um, when we were really struggling, like it was really bad. 
Um, I had struggled trying different things, even from my youth. I haven't had a quote unquote job since I was 24 and I'm 51 now. But back when I was learning and trying to figure it out in my mid 20s and trying to get things going, I mean, it was brutal. You know, I would do something selling this, selling that. And there would be good months. And then I would take it easy. And it, it was tough. It's not the way to do it. And then I made a decision. And I was married with my wife at the time. And in 2004, regardless of what we made, you see, my son was just little. He was about a little year, close to a year and a half. And it was brutal because my wife stayed home to raise our kids. And then once they were older and all in school, she went back to work. And it was so tough. The entire year for 2004, I made $14,500. Crazy, right? $14,500 for the whole year for me, my wife, and a kid and a house that we were renting. But in that year, I was learning real estate with this company, and I was doing this, you know, learning prices all over the city. So then what we decided to do was regardless of how much, I told my wife, look, we can't live off of how much we have anyways. And so we said, you know what? Forget it. We're going to be obedient. And we're going to tithe. We started to tithe that whole year, only $14,500. And in that little, we were obedient to tithe. And what happened after that? Well, I can't tell you because many of you guys know the story. Well, I can tell you, but I don't want to go into the whole story. You guys know the story. We ended up with a bunch of real estate. Things started to explode. Uh, you've seen the picture of the Hummer H2. I had a Porsche and, you know, all of this stuff. It was fantastic. I was foolish still, but you see, the, the, the process of it was a huge learning lesson and that we were willing to in the little that we ended up getting a lot, you see? And so this is something that I certainly won't fall to. And I'm hoping that in never having really covered this before, that we are now, you know, as we're drawing closer, we're, there's a lot more deeper little little tidbits that that are preparing us and strengthening us and 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 giving us these little preparations so that our hearts our minds our spirits we are ready when the lord comes we won't be able to say oh my goodness you know i never considered that that's why i'm sharing this that we can remember this we can be prepared and not be caught as an ananias I, I, I hope it's I hope there is no Ananias and his wife in, in our day in the is to come. I pray that there isn't, especially not from this group, Lord. Absolutely not. Right. Listen to what happens to them. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart and kept that back to uh, the price, uh, that portion of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold? Was it not thine own in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart uh, that thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God? And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. So it's right up in that time. You see, right in that time, we're, we're about to go and work, but it would appear that all this selling has to take place. To, to get rid of our stuff, use it, and it'll be used for ministering throughout the time of seals. Ananias falls dead on the spot. What? And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young man arose, wound, uh, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after that his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered, uh, and Peter answered unto her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. You see, so instead of saying, hey, this is what happened to your husband, he's like, let's see what she's going to do. And what does she do? It's her chance. It's her chance to come clean, even though she doesn't know what her husband is. If the spirit is convicting her and she's not convicted and listen to what happens. And she said, yeah, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, how is it? 
that you have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. And poof, she drops dead. Then she fell down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, found her dead body and carried her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Yikes, right? Could you imagine that kind of power? That's this power from the uh, from the apostles, guys, through the spirit in them. I want to make sure we're prepared from every angle that we possibly can understand and know in advance. That's what we've been doing for almost six and a half years. Preparing, preparing, readying, drawing closer, drawing more in, giving revelation, helping understand, preparing, preparing, preparing. And we just so happen to be called 14ers and have the revelation of the mysteries that had never been before known. Craziness, right? Preparing, brothers and sisters. All right, let's go to this one. <clears throat> this one, there's not a lot in it uh, in relation to what we're going to share um, in, in what he says, but in the things that it shows. So now check this out. Right off the bat, we don't have, uh, I don't, you're not going to play anything here. I'm just going to show you the parts. So a lot of people have seen this image before, right? So this is essentially the setup of what it looks like when they were lined up in the wilderness. My heater is whistling, it bothers me. <laughs> I had to go smack it. All right. Now, what you have to understand is when people show it like this, it's not really the way it looked like. Now, now it looked like this, but you see what they want to do is make it look like a cross, like you're standing in front of a cross. But what it really looked like was like this. East is over here, there's north, there's west, and there's south. So really, this is where the head is, this is where the feet is, uh, the feet are, and then you've got the arms on the two sides. All right? So we're going to get back to this image in a bit. So this is what you're really seeing. So this is east, right? South, west, and north. But now check this out. We're gonna we're gonna go into this layout a little bit more in the begin uh, in in a couple minutes. But I wanted you to see this right here. Now you've probably seen of this before. You may have looked into it. Now it can become so much more clear for us. You go search this up, and just about everybody, if not everybody, well, I mean, it's rare that everybody's in agreement. So the vast majority, this is the consensus of what is laid out: Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. What do we have? The lion, the ox, the man, the eagle. Huh. Huh. Do you think that's just by chance? Do you know why we say that? What do you know about Luke? Well, let me first explain. What do we know what happens first? We know that the pre-trib happens at the beginning of the 50 days. Okay? At the beginning of the 50 days, which means what? Well, when Christ came the first time, who did Christ come as, guys? He was of the tribe of Dan. I mean, uh, of the tribe of, of David, right? Uh, sorry, of Judah. He was the line of the tribe of Judah. So when he came the first time, he was the line of the tribe of Judah. And when he comes at the end, he'll be the line of the tribe of Judah, right? When he comes feet down. But before... He comes as the son of man. You remember this video? Watch this. Remember this video? The coming four messiahs? You think they realize? The messiah, the messiah, the messiah? <laughs> I'll bet you they don't realize it. I'll bet you most people don't understand what they're saying in representing these four messiahs. But the pre-trib the pre-trib right before the 50 days begin will be connected to the east. They will be connected to the lion of the tribe of Judah from the east. 
where the sun rises, the east, that is the entrance, that is the pre-trip. But what do we know for the Luke group represented by his discourse when the Lord comes as what? As the Messiah prophet. Remember in the video of the four messiahs? When he comes as the Luke group, what's he coming as? He's coming as the man. He's coming as the prophet. They say overseer, but he's coming as the prophet. And he's going to be what? As Jonah was. And he's coming as a man. This is the 40 days of the son of man. And it's connected to Luke. What's the man? Right here. It's what? It's the south. So the man is south. That's the 40 days representation of the son of man. What else do we have? Well, we know at the end of Mark, what's the end of Mark? It's the Lord coming as Messiah ben Joseph. What do we read in relation to Simeon in, um, in Luke chapter 2, right? Luke in order, Luke chapter 2, in relation to the 40 days of the Son of Man? And Simeon was there. And that the Holy Ghost had told him that he wouldn't taste of death till he saw the, the coming of the Son of Man? Simeon. And Simeon represents the West, which is the Luke, Son of Man, related to the 40 days when he comes as Jonah the prophet. At the end of Mark, what's the Lord coming as? Exactly like we've been teaching for three years now. He's coming as the ox. He's coming as the ox, which is Messiah ben Joseph through Ephraim. Hello. What happens at mid-trumpets? At mid-trumpets, we have the representation of the eagle. Let's go look at these things. In Revel, oops, I did it again. I think my other finger's nicking it. In Revelation chapter 12, this, this imagery of, of these four and, and this, this setup around, uh, um, uh, uh, around the, temp the tabernacle in the wilderness is a total prophetic picture in the years to come. It's incredible. What do we know happens when Satan's cast down and it's the first woe? What does he do? He goes after her with the flood and she goes what? She flies on the wings of a great eagle into the wilderness. That's what? Mid-trumpets. So we have the picture of the eagle being mid-trumpets. And the eagle also represents Dan. So now there's something maybe going on here. And I'm still working on something else. Remember I was telling you I'm building on more things with Dan. Ephraim will probably be included, but I'm working on some stuff with Dan still. Because remember, there is a good Dan and a bad Dan. We've shown that the good Dan is also working on this side here. But we also know that there's another Dan. And what do we know about this Dan? Well, he's a, he's a serpent, right? The one side of Dan is an eagle, right? The overcoming eagle. And even though this is the eagle and there's the good eagle, which may account for remnant workers, right? Those remnant disciple workers may be continuing to work through trumpets, okay? This might be a glimpse. I'm not, I haven't done enough study in there yet, but we're seeing little tastes of it. And we see this eagle, but we also know that there's the bad side of Dan. And the bad side of Dan is what? A serpent. It's a serpent. Well, what happens at mid-trumpets when the woman flies away on the, on the wings of a great eagle, which is the good portion of Dan, we also have the bad portion of Dan, which was the one that was cast down, which is that old serpent. Hello. You see how everything's in order? And then what do we have at the end? It brings it back to the east. We have um, Matthew, which is the lion, which brings us back to the east. And what do we know about the lion? He is the lion of the tribe of Judah when he comes with his garments dipped in blood and the, the, the wrath of Lord God Almighty at the grapes of wrath. 
the man for 40 days, the ox at the end of seals through through trumpets, the eagle at mid trumpets, and the lion at post trip. All of it there in order. Now, look at this with John. John is very interesting because we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which were clearly understood. But when I was telling you earlier that there would be a connection to John that I was still going to cover, look what happens. Let me go to this picture. Watch this. So now this one's in order. There's your east, south, west, north. Okay? Free trip happens here. Then the Lord comes. Listen to this. The Lord comes as the man for 40 days. What's he coming as? Man. He's coming. He's going to be what? The leader of a troop or the leader of a group. And it's a sword at the gate. Well, we already understand him coming as a man, as the leader. And with what? Well, we have a warning about the sword. Does that sound familiar? Ezekiel chapter 21. In Ezekiel chapter 21, we see the picture of Ezekiel as a typology as the son of man when he's here as the man for 40 days. And it says, son of man, set thy face toward Jerusalem and drop thy word toward the holy places uh, and prophesy against the land of Israel. And say to the land of Israel, thus saith the Lord, behold, I am against thee and I will draw forth my sword out of his sheep and I will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked. See then. That I, seeing then that I will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked, therefore shall my sword go forth out of his sheath against all flesh from the south to the north, all against furbishing the sheath. He, I mean, furbishing the sword from the sheath. It's sharpened, it's ready to make a sore slaughter. Because when the Son of Man is here, what do we know he's doing for 40 days? He's warning about the sword. He's warning about the coming of the sword. This is, this is exactly what we're seeing. Even in Revelation chapter 6, we know that the Son of Man, when he's here for 40 days, is the white horse rider. And while he's here as the white horse rider, he's warning as Jonah was. And he's warning what? That Jerusalem is going to be comp compassed about. Then they're going to be slaughtered. And then what happens? After the compassing about, the Son of Man's 40 days are over. Three more days, and then we know that they're going to be attacked and destroyed by Syria and those with them. And what happens when Syria comes? Well, when the 50 days are over, the anointing of those disciples, they receive the Holy Ghost anointing. <clears throat> they go out from there. And the sword that that the Son of Man, uh, the the yeah, that the Son of Man was warning about is now going out with the red horse rider. Peace was taken from the earth and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. You see, again, showing that the Son of Man is the white horse rider, is here for 40 days, <clears throat> is the one represented by Ezekiel in chapter 21, warning about the sword that's coming next when they see themselves get compassed about. Again, exactly with the prophetic picture as the man. Well, what do we have next? We have the end of seals. And what is he? Jesus is coming as the ox. The ox, as we've been teaching forever, is the high priest. The ox is the Messiah ben Joseph through Ephraim, who is going to be the Joshua type after Moses, who is the high priest, who is going to what? Be the one to bring them over into the promised land in that seventh year for the great multitude rapture. So we see him as the ox or the bullock. And then what else? Well, we have the picture with Manasseh as the olive branch. Well, isn't that fantastic? Let's go to Genesis chapter 8. You guys all know this story. In the, in the big picture of the story of Noah, we see the 40 days typology come to an end of the Son of Man. Then we know there's what? Three days that remain to the dove. So we have the raven sent out first, which is the Arab, which represents that antichrist spirit we say that that raven spirit which is the arab and it's from the dust dusty hue the the complexion of their skin and that's going to be syria who is compassing them about after the 40 days during the three days and then you have the dove that's sent out 
That's the 50th day. When that 50th day is done, the raven, Syria, attacks and destroys Jerusalem, for which the 40 days the Son of Man had been warning that the sword is coming, and he's giving it to the raven. Then what? Then the dove leaves, goes back into the ark, goes to the ark, all right? Remember that one. And stayed yet seven other days. The word stayed, this was fantastic, right? Means tribulation. The tribulation has begun. This word stayed just means waiting. You see? This is the beginning of tribulation at the start of 14 years. Seven days, seven days, seven years, seven years in the picture, prophetic picture. What happens after the seven days or in the seven years of seals? Verse 11. <laughs> and the dove came uh, in to him, and in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf, which olive, ol also means branch, an olive branch plucked off. What does plucked mean? Plucked is another word for harpazo, right? Plucked is to pull out, harpazo, pull out with force, pluck out of the way quickly. What do we see? Well, what's happening? What's happening? Here comes Messiah ben Joseph to, 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 to take the great multitude rapture over as the high priest now, as the, as the Melchizedek high priest. Messiah ben Joseph, he's coming as the ox, and he's gathering those of the olive branch. He's gathering those of the grafted in. And then we have a wolf. Well, who's this prophetic picture of the wolf? Remember what I told you with John when we saw this? John in relation to John's gospel. And I was telling you how John, with the 21 chapters, is a prophetic picture of the first seven easy, then the seven years of seals, then the seven years of trumpets. <clears throat> what do we know about the wolf? Well, the wolf, of course, is a prophetic picture of the Antichrist. We know that the Antichrist is going to receive his power to continue 42 months. So he'll already be here from the beginning, but he's going to receive this power where he will now be the guy about two and a half years into seals. About two and a half years into all of 14 years. The first two and a half years is World War III. Then he steps on the scene and he has the power to continue 42 months. And what happens in that third year, which is two and a half years in? John chapter 10. Let's go see what happens in John chapter 10, who stands on his own, but is related to a prophetic picture of events taking place with the workers. Look what happens. Jesus says in verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door unto the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own by name, and leadeth them out. Okay? He's telling them, be ready, because another shepherd is going to come to you, and he's coming in through a different way. Don't believe him. So who is this one? Verse 5. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him. Why, why is there this fleeing that's going to take place at this point? Why is there this other stranger who is coming in through a different door? Why are those who know Christ going to flee from him here? Because at the two and a half year mark, when this happens which is Revelation chapter 13, it's the picture of Mark chapter 13 when they're to flee into the wilderness because this is the time of the abomination of desolation in seals portion where the Antichrist gets his power to continue and it's the time of the mark of the beast. This is the time, excuse me, this is the time when they're going to flee from the false Messiah. We've shared that many times. So what are they going to do? They're going to flee from him. And who is the one that shows up? Well, let's have a look. John 10.10. 10. The thief comes not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. 
I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth life for the sheep, gives his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, see the wolf coming and leave the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. Remember what I said about Mark's discourse, chapter 13? In his discourse midway through, this is the point right here of that about two and a half years where you have the abomination of desolation, which is going to be the mark of the beast for the church, for the world, during the time of seals. And what are they to do? Time to flee. It's time to flee. Because now, you see, it's going to be a time worse than it was since the beginning of the creation. Remember, this word's only found in Mark. How fitting, right? Because they're the creation of light. They're the ones he's coming back to save, his lost sheep. And except the Lord had shortened those days, um, verse 22, for false Christs and false prophets. This is the first time going Luke, Mark, Matthew in their discourses. This is the first time false Christs and false prophets show up at the time when they're to flee, when the wolf, when the wolf connected to this portion of John, right? John, who, who is to the, to, the tri, uh, um, to the workers, here we are in chapter 10, we see the wolf coming, but to kill and to destroy as the false sheep. I mean, as the false shepherd. So you see, in showing this, I wanted you to see, we can see that John, even in John 8, which is like the beginning of the 14 years, here's the Lord saying, I am the light of the world. He's bringing his light into the darkness because it's all begun. In two and a half years later, we see the wolf shows up and those who know the Lord are fleeing. And the rest he is scattering because he's catching them and killing them and doing all these things. In chapter 14, we see that he is coming now with the place prepared for them. This is when he's now come as the ox with this place prepared. Let's go back to that picture. So here he is. He's come as the ox. He's got the great multitude rapture group after he kills the wolf. Remember Daniel chapter 7, the beast that gets killed. The beast was, is not and shall be again at mid-trumpets when the serpent, who is Satan, is cast down, and then the pit is opened, and the beast comes back. We've been able to show this, remember, in the discourses. That's why Mark, you see the abomination desolation, then you see false Christ and false prophets. You go to the first half of Matthew's discourse, which is the seven years of trumpets, and there's only the false prophet, but no false Christ. That's because the false Christ was killed. The beast was killed. And then at the abomination of desolation, midway through, which is represented here, when Satan is cast down, like Revelation chapter 12, it's at the first woe at the fifth trumpet, which is mid trumpets, about three and a half years into trumpets or ten and a half years into tribulation. What happens? Satan's cast down. The pit is open. He goes after them. They fly away on the wings of an eagle. And who's been cast down? The serpent. So here we go. We go to Revelation chapter 12 again. And this was precisely what we saw. That old serpent. So we have the pre-trib. We have the mid-trib great multitude rapture was caught up. We have the place of 1260 days where the um, two witnesses are doing their work for the first half of trumpets. And while Michael and his angels are fighting against Satan and his. And then at the three and a half year approximately point of trumpets or ten and a half years into tribulation, Satan is cast down. Who's Satan? That great dragon, right? The great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan. And of course, the pit is opened because it's the fifth trumpet and the uh, beast comes back. He is the one who was, second half of seals, is not, first half of trumpets, and shall be, second half of trumpets. And it's the serpent. 
So we have a dual thing going on here, uh, going on here in relation to the ego being, again, that good side of Dan, which may be leading us to, to understand that the SEALs workers of Dan, like Priscilla and Aquila, may very well continue on during trumpets. May very well continue on during trumpets. So you've got the eagle overcomer good side, and you've got the serpent bad side. You'll have heard that from many people's teachings on prophecy that they believe the Antichrist is coming from Dan. And there he is. It's the serpent side. When is Satan cast down? At the time of the serpent and at the time of the eagle. Serpent is cast down. The eagle flies them away into the wilderness. And then what happens? Then we have post-trip. What happens at post-trip? He's the lion, you see? The man, the ox, the eagle, the lion. All of it in perfect order. Even their descriptions within events. So now look at what happens with the lion. Of course, we have the lion, a scepter, and the grapevine, right? So when, when trumpets even were started, we know that it was the time of grapes. And when he comes as the lion of the tribe of Judah, when he returns feet down, what is he doing? He's going to make war against them, and his vestiture dipped in blood. That he should smite them with the treading of the winepress of, the, of Almighty God. We know this and who he is when he comes as the lion of the tribe of Judah in the last days, revealed to us in the description of Judah, being a lion or a lion's whelp. Whelp. The scepter that shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh or peace or Messiah come. And what does it say? Listen to this. Binding his fowl to a vine and his ass, his ass is called unto a choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. So we know when he's coming as Messiah Ben David, when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives with his blood, uh, with his garments dipped in the blood of grapes from the treading of the wine press of Almighty God, and he's coming with the fowl and his ass is cold. And he's, of course, the lion and with the scepter. Well, what else do we know about the ass? Well, again, this is something we know from the triumphal entry. Remember, the prophetic picture of the triumphal entry from Luke is the coming of him for 40 days. The triumphal entry in Mark is a prophetic picture of him coming after the sixth year of seals. The triumphal entry of Matthew is the prophetic picture of him coming after the sixth year of trumpets or after the 13th year of tribulation when he returns feet down to destroy the enemies in that final year, which is the day of the Lord, the year of his vengeance. And only in Matthew, in the triumphal entry, does it have an ass. Only in Matthew. This is one of those differences in the Gospels that for many has been a, a difficult contradiction to understand. Because Mark and Luke only have the colt. Only Matthew has the ass. Why? Prophecy yet to be fulfilled. Did you see? In Genesis 49, it said in the last days. It'll be in the last days. It'll be when he comes as Messiah ben David, feet down, that he comes with both the ass and the colt. This hasn't yet been fulfilled. It's a prophetic insight to the end. So you have the lion, the scepter, the grapevine. You have the ass of burden. Every piece in order from the man, the ox, the eagle, and the lion, and prophetic images of those periods of time in the definitions of each of the tribes. It's awesome, guys. It's amazing, amazing stuff. Then you take our teaching on the four messiahs, understanding each one, that they have Luke for the son of man as the man. The end of Mark, which is the ox. <clears throat> John, which is the eagle, because he's the representation of the workers. 
And then you've got Matthew, who is the lion when he returns feet down. All of it is in order. Did I make this? No, scriptures told us. Did I do this? No, scriptures told us. But we were able to reveal these things through the differences in the Gospels, using the old and the new, using the was and the is to reveal the revelation and the understanding of the is to come. It's awesome. It's incredible stuff. Conf confirmation, confirmation, confirmation to strengthen us every step of the way to know that the revelations are all true. And we use other people's teachings from Scripture to be able to prove it out to you. It just adds another layer to the revelation. Check this out. This is what? The ox. This is called what? The beginning. What's this? That's his feet, right? The lion. What is that? The end. The beginning and the end. What's the beginning, guys? What's the beginning? You guessed it. Begins from Taurus. The ox, Aleph, in the beginning. The count begins from Taurus, brothers and sisters. And his birthday, being right here, begins a count of seven Sabbaths, which take us to the 8th of Av, pre-trib, August 12th, 2024. If it is 2024, which we have proven, I believe it was. I believe it is. And then the 50 days begin. There's your seven-day wedding. And he returns two months after his birthday, just as Isaiah 9 confirmed in Matthew chapter 4, from the time when Jesus fulfilled the was and the is, not at his birthday, but two months later when John was put into prison, fulfilling the time of the end of the winter wheat harvest when the bread with leaven is brought in to what begins the count of 50 days that will end at Elul 29, true new wine of Pentecost, when actual time frame of new wine from the harvest of grapes is actually ready and called new wine. And then on the day and hour, no one knows, Tishri 1, Syria, the lion will attack and destroy. The raven spirit will attack. The Ishmael will attack and destroy Jerusalem. Now, let me bring it to an end with this final piece to confirm yet again three worker groups outside of the, outside of the apostles. Watch this. Check this out. I don't know. I'm not speaking specifically in relation to the tribes that are there, but there were three Levitical priestly duties in each together. How many? How many was that? Three? Three priestly lines? Three groups? Three watches? Remember how one was connected to the ark? The other one is what? Tabernacle furnishings and altar. And the third one is the tabernacle. Well, how about that? Let's show that one. What do we know about this one, guys? How about the ark story itself and the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man? And what happened when the 40 days of the Son of Man? While he's here for 40 days, it's going to be as the 40 days of Noah. Connected to what? The ark. Connected to when the ark was lifted. What did it say? What, what, what was the picture for the second group? For the second watch group? The second priestly line? Furnishings and altar. Well, guess what? When we come to Mark 
And in Mark's, uh, da -da 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 -da, I think it's 14. In Mark chapter, yeah, 14. What happened? What do we know about the, the story of the of the uh, 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 Last Supper and then the resurrection? It's a prophetic picture of the coming of the Lord at the end of each. So here's the end of six years of seals. And only in Mark's do you see furnished and prepared. Furnished and prepared. Both rooms, see, a large upper room. The word is used twice. It's only used in Luke's and it's used in Mark's. Why? Because both of them are being taken to what? One to the third heaven, one to paradise. When the Lord comes with paradise, it's not only furnished, it's also prepared. Because just as he told us in John chapter 14, which is a prophetic picture of the seventh year of seals, when he comes with the place prepared, it's paradise to where the rapture group is going. Exactly. Furnished and altar. This furnished and prepared place. Where else do we see this? Check this out. We've shown it also in 2nd Esdras. Here's our pre-trib group going. Then bewilderment of mind. They're going to plan to make war against each other. Red horse rider time. Then all the things that I said would occur, which is during seals. Then my son will be revealed, as you saw, standing on Mount Zion. Because it's what? The mountain carved without hand. The stone that became a great mountain. Which is the end of the sixth year of seals. And what does he come with? The place prepared and built when he comes with paradise where do we get this from there's the second group this is a picture of like your 144,000 what's the third group the tabernacle the tabernacle who do we know is the final group well that would be Matthew's group and Matthew's group is the third watch so this represents the three watches that were told and we started off in Luke chapter 12 with. And so what do we know about the final watch? Here they are right here. It's a completely different story. He tells he's going to teach them. They're to go out and teach all nations. No longer preaching. The Lord has returned like, like uh, the seventh trumpet. All power is given unto him in heaven and in earth. No more preaching. They're going to teach the world, all nations. The things that he commands them. And he's now with them till the end of the world. Because he's now here feet down till the end of the millennial reign just like revelation chapter 14 this is when he has now come as messiah ben david feet down is is going to be his garments dipped in blood because it's the battle that he's coming to fight that final one he's come feet down on the mount of olives and what are the tribes as matthew 28 that represent the gates what are they going to do there to go out and teach all nations to go up every year to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to what? Keep the Feast of Tabernacles. To what? Keep the Feast of Tabernacles. To what? Keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Three worker groups. And when we go into the scriptures, these guys, which I hadn't seen before, there are three groups of priestly duties. There's our pre, Luke remnant workers. There's our end of seals through trumpets workers. And there's our post-trib tabernacle workers. Three watch priestly working groups. Brothers and sisters, I hope and pray this has blessed you. I, I hope we, we got a little bit more detail. We've got many more confirmations. We can see these things from so many different angles. There is nobody, I believe, on earth, in my opinion, that should be as prepared as us. There will be others prepared, I'm sure. But as prepared as us, having been given the blessings through the Spirit, in the will of the Father, in the truth of the revelation of Jesus Christ, to prepare a people in advance. Brothers and sisters, it just keeps proving it out over and over and over again. And I hope and pray each and every one of us will be ready. And you know, as I finish this up, 
it reminds me again of this as I was reading through that, that when we saw this stuff in relation to, to the layout and to Dan here and the eagle side of Dan, it really, it, it got me pondering again if it really is that the SEALs workers would continue even through to the end of Trumpets. That that first priestly line maybe continues, but we just saw that there was three worker groups, right? We know there's a group chosen here that works during this. We know there's a group at the end of this that works during this. And then there's a group at the end of this through the tribes that are chosen to work through the millennial reign to the end. And that this group that works, that were chosen with the Lord here, working through here, we know that they put their necks on the line and they're going to take part in the resurrection. But we know that the apostles, the 144 that worked during this, and that the 12 tribes at the end, those three groups are going to be part of New Jerusalem coming down at the end of millennial reign. But that this group, who are the 40 days with the Son of Man, the first priestly group, their 40 days with the Son of Man through seals, they don't have a part in that because theirs is what? The resurrection of the just. Their part is to rule and reign as priests with Christ for the thousand years. They will be with them forever. It's wild. Wild, wild stuff. So, you know, it, it seems like the ones that are dead, of course, they will go and be with the Lord. He will bind them and everything else. And then they'll be resurrected for the millennial reign. But there may even be some that continue right through to the end. Maybe that's this eagle portion, that it is that eagle portion who, even though their work might be done at the end of seals, they're there with them on Mount Zion, and maybe those that are alive are the eagle portions that take them away into the wilderness for the Lord. Right? There, there's some sort of connection going on there with the good and then the bad. But just that's just a side note. You know, we're we're still digging in, but we're seeing these connections, and it's clearly being revealed that there are three watches. That there are the apostles that come first. That there will be a selling in this, this, this new insight, this new piece that we can add to the picture. There will be a selling of our goods. And I want to make sure in sharing this that none of us will be those that would be caught trying to lie to the Holy Ghost. Brothers and sisters, I love you always. I love your families. I pray for you guys always. God bless you. God bless each and every one of you always. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.